Section 39 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adam and Joseph Berg Eisenwein. Section 39. Appendix D. Speeches for Study and Practice. Theodore Roosevelt. Inaugural Address, 1905. My fellow citizens, no people on earth have more cause to be thankful than ours, and this is said reverently, in no spirit of boastfulness in our own strength, but with gratitude to the giver of good, who has blessed us with the conditions which have enabled us to achieve so large a measure of well-being and happiness. To us as a people it has been granted to lay the foundations of our national life in a new continent. We are the heirs of the ages, and yet we have had to pay few of the penalties which in old countries are exacted by the dead hand of a bygone civilization. We have not been obliged to fight for our existence against any alien race, and yet our life has called for the vigor and effort without which the manlier and hardier virtues wither away. Under such conditions it would be our own fault if we failed and the success which we have had in the past, the success which we confidently believe the future will bring, should cause in us no feeling of vain glory, but rather a deep and abiding realization of all that life has offered us, a full acknowledgment of the responsibility which is ours, and a fixed determination to show that under a free government a mighty people can thrive best, alike as regard the things of the body and the things of the soul. Much has been given to us, and much will rightfully be expected from us. We have duties to others and duties to ourselves, and we can shirk neither. We have become a great nation, forced by the fact of its greatness into relation to the other nations of the earth, and we must behave as beseems a people with such responsibilities. Toward all other nations, large and small, our attitude must be one of cordial and sincere friendship. We must show not only in our words, but in our deeds, that we are earnestly desirous of securing their good will by acting toward them in a spirit of just and generous recognition of all their rights. But justice and generosity in a nation, as in an individual, count most when shown not by the weak, but by the strong. While ever careful to refrain from wronging others, we must be no less insistent that we are not wronged ourselves. We wish peace but we wish the peace of justice, the peace of righteousness. We wish it because we think it is right, and not because we are afraid. No weak nation that acts rightly and justly should ever have cause to fear, and no strong power should ever be able to single us out as a subject for insolent aggression. Our relations with the other powers of the world are important but still more important are our relations among ourselves. Such growth in wealth, in population, and in power, as a nation has seen during a century and a quarter of its national life, is inevitably accompanied by a like growth in the problems which are ever before every nation that rises to greatness. Power invariably means both responsibility and danger. Our forefathers faced certain perils which we have outgrown. We now face other perils, the very existence of which it was impossible that they should foresee. Modern life is both complex and intense, and the tremendous changes wrought by the extraordinary industrial development of the half-century are felt in every fiber of our social and political being. Never before have men tried so vast and formidable an experiment as that of administering the affairs of a continent under the forms of a democratic republic. 
the conditions which have told for our marvelous material well-being, which have developed to a very high degree our energy, self-reliance, and individual initiative, also have brought the care and anxiety inseparable from the accumulation of great wealth in industrial centers. Upon the success of our experiment much depends, not only as regards our own welfare, but as regards the welfare of mankind. If we fail, the cause of free self-government throughout the world will rock to its foundations, and therefore our responsibility is heavy to ourselves, to the world as it is today, and to the generations yet unborn. There is no good reason why we should fear the future, but there is every reason why we should face it seriously, neither hiding from ourselves the gravity of the problems before us, nor fearing to approach these problems with the unbending, unflinching purpose to solve them aright. Yet after all, though the problems are new, though the tasks set before us differ from the tasks set before our fathers who founded and preserved this republic, the spirit in which these tasks must be undertaken and these problems faced, if our duty is to be well done, remains essentially unchanged. We know that self-government is difficult. We know that no people needs such high traits of character as that people which seeks to govern its affairs aright through the freely expressed will of the free men who compose it. But we have faith that we shall not prove false to memories of the men of the mighty past. They did their work. They left us the splendid heritage we now enjoy. We in turn have an assured confidence that we shall be able to leave this heritage unwasted and enlarged to our children's children. To do so, we must show, not merely in great crises, but in the everyday affairs of life, the qualities of practical intelligence, of courage, of hardihood and endurance, and, above all, the power of devotion to a lofty ideal which made great the men who founded this republic in the days of Washington, which made great the men who preserved this republic in the days of Abraham Lincoln. On American Motherhood, 1905. Footnote. From his speech in Washington on March 13, 1905, before the National Congress of Mothers, printed from a copy furnished by the President for this collection, in response to a request. In our modern industrial civilization, there are many and grave dangers to counterbalance the splendors and the triumphs. It is not a good thing to see cities grow at disproportionate speed relatively to the country, for the small landowners, the men who own their little homes, and therefore to a very large extent the men who till farms, the men of the soil, have hitherto made the foundation of lasting national life in every state. And, if the foundation becomes either too weak or too narrow, the superstructure, no matter how attractive, is in imminent danger of falling. But far more important than the question of the occupation of our citizens is the question of how their family life is conducted. No matter what that occupation may be, as long as there is a real home and as long as those who make up that home do their duty to one another, to their neighbors, and to the state, it is of minor consequence whether the man's trade is plied in the country or in the city, whether it calls for the work of the hands or for the work of the head. No piled-up worth, no splendor of material growth, no brilliance of artistic development will permanently avail any people unless its home life is healthy, unless the average man possesses honesty, courage, common sense, and decency, unless he works hard and is willing at need to fight hard, and unless the average woman is a good wife, a good mother, able and willing to perform the first and greatest duty of womanhood, able and willing to bear and to bring up, as they should be brought up, healthy children, sound in body, mind, and character, 
and numerous enough so that the race shall increase and not decrease. There are certain old truths which will be true as long as this world endures, and which no amount of progress can alter. One of these is the truth that the primary duty of the husband is to be the homemaker, the breadwinner for his wife and children, and that the primary duty of the woman is to be the helpmate, the housewife, and mother. The woman should have ample educational advantages, but save in exceptional cases, the man must be, and she need not be, and generally ought not to be, trained for a lifelong career as the family breadwinner. And therefore, after a certain point, the training of the two must normally be different, because the duties of the two are normally different. This does not mean inequality of function, but it does mean that normally there must be dissimilarity of function. On the whole, I think the duty of the woman the more important, the more difficult, and the more honorable of the two. On the whole, I respect the woman who does her duty even more than I respect the man who does his. No ordinary work done by a man is either as hard or as responsible as the work of a woman who is bringing up a family of small children. For upon her time and strength demands are made not only every hour of the day, but often every hour of the night. She may have to get up night after night to take care of a sick child, and yet must, by day, continue to do all her household duties as well. And if the family means are scant, she must usually enjoy even her rare holidays taking a whole brood of children with her. The birth pangs make all men the debtors of all women. Above all, our sympathy and regard are due to the struggling wives amongst those whom Abraham Lincoln called the plain people and whom he so loved and trusted. For the lives of these women are often led on the lonely heights of quiet, self-sacrificing heroism. Just as the happiness and most honorable and most useful task that can be set any man is to earn enough for the support of his wife and family, for the bringing up and starting in life of his children, so the most important, the most honorable and desirable task which can be set any woman is to be a good and wise mother in a home marked by self-respect and mutual forbearance, by willingness to perform duty and by refusal to sink into self-indulgence or avoid that which entails effort and self-sacrifice. Of course there are exceptional men and exceptional women who can do and ought to do much more than this, who can lead and ought to lead great careers of outside usefulness in addition to, not as substitutes for, their home work. But I am not speaking of exceptions. I am speaking of the primary duties. I am speaking of the average citizens, the average men and women who make up the nation. Inasmuch as I am speaking to an assemblage of mothers, I shall have nothing whatsoever to say in praise of an easy life. Yours is the work which is never ended. No mother has an easy time. The most mothers have very hard times. And yet what true mother would barter her experience of joy and sorrow in exchange for a life of cold selfishness, which insists upon perpetual amusement and the avoidance of care, and which often finds its fit dwelling place in some flat designed to furnish, with the least possible expenditure of effort, the maximum of comfort and of luxury, but in which there is literally no place for children. The woman who is a good wife, a good mother, is entitled to our respect, as is no one else, but she is entitled to it only because, and so long as, she is worthy of it. Effort and self-sacrifice are the law of worthy life for the man as for the woman, though neither the effort nor the self-sacrifice may be the same for the one as for the other. 
I do not in the least believe in the patient Griselda type of woman, in the woman who submits to gross and long continued ill treatment, any more than I believe in a man who tamely submits to wrongful aggression. No wrongdoing is so abhorrent as wrongdoing by a man toward the wife and the children who should arouse every tender feeling in his nature. Selfishness toward them, lack of tenderness toward them, lack of consideration for them, above all brutality in any form toward them, should arouse the heartiest scorn and indignation in every upright soul. I believe in the woman keeping her self-respect just as I believe in the man doing so. I believe in her rights just as much as I believe in the man's and indeed a little more, and I regard marriage as a partnership in which each partner is in honor, bound to think of the rights of the other as well as of his or her own. But I think that the duties are even more important than the rights, and in the long run I think that the reward is ampler and greater for duty well done than for the insistence upon individual rights necessary though this too must often be. Your duty is hard, your responsibility great, but greatest of all is your reward. I do not pity you in the least. On the contrary, I feel respect and admiration for you. Into the woman's keeping is committed the destiny of the generations to come after us. In bringing up your children, you mothers must remember that while it is essential to be loving and tender, it is no less essential to be wise and firm. Foolishness and affection must not be treated as interchangeable terms. And besides training your sons and daughters in the softer and milder virtues, you must seek to give them those stern and hardy qualities which in after life they will surely need. Some children will go wrong in spite of the best training, and some will go right even when their surroundings are most unfortunate. Nevertheless, an immense amount depends upon the family training. If you mothers through weakness bring up your sons to be selfish and to think only of themselves, you will be responsible for much sadness among the women who are to be their wives in the future. If you let your daughters grow up idle, perhaps under the mistaken impression that as you yourselves have had to work hard, they should know only enjoyment, you are preparing them to be useless to others and burdens to themselves. Teach boys and girls alike that they are not to look forward to lives spent in avoiding difficulties, but to lives spent in overcoming difficulties. Teach them that work for themselves and also for others is not curse but a blessing. Seek to make them happy, to make them enjoy life, but seek also to make them face life with a steadfast resolution to wrest success from labor and adversity and to do their whole duty before God and to man. Surely she who can thus train her sons and her daughters is thrice fortunate among women. There are many good people who are denied the supreme blessing of children, and for these we have the respect and sympathy always due to those who, from no fault of their own, are denied any of the other great blessings of life. But a man or woman who deliberately foregoes these blessings, whether from viciousness, coldness, shallow-heartedness, self-indulgence, or mere failure to appreciate a right the difference between the all-important and the unimportant, why, such a creature merits contempt as hearty as any visited upon the soldier who runs away in battle or upon the man who refuses to work for the support of those dependent upon him, and who, though able-bodied, is yet content to eat in idleness the bread which others provide. The existence of women of this type forms one of the most unpleasant and unwholesome features of modern life. 
If any one is so dim of vision as to fail to see what a thoroughly unlovely creature such a woman is, I wish they would read Judge Robert Grant's novel Unleavened Bread, ponder seriously the character of Selma, and think of the fate that would surely overcome any nation which developed its average and typical woman along such lines. Unfortunately, it would be untrue to say that this type exists only in American novels. That it also exists in American life is made unpleasantly evident by the statistics as to the dwindling families in some localities. It is made evident in equally sinister fashion by the census statistics as to divorce, which are fairly appalling. For easy divorce is now as it ever has been a bane to any nation a curse to society a menace to the home an incitement to married unhappiness and to immorality an evil thing for men and a still more hideous evil for women these unpleasant tendencies in our american life are made evident by articles such as those which i actually read not long ago in a certain paper where a clergyman was quoted seemingly with approval as expressing the general american attitude when he said that the ambition of any save a very rich man should be to rear two children only so as to give his children an opportunity to taste a few of the good things of life. This man, whose profession and calling should have made him a moral teacher, actually set before others the ideal not of training children to do their duty, not of sending them forth with stout hearts and ready minds to win triumphs for themselves and their country, not of allowing them the opportunity and giving them the privilege of making their own place in the world but forsooth of keeping the number of children so limited that they might taste a few good things the way to give a child a fair chance in life is not to bring it up in luxury but to see that it has the kind of training that will give it strength of character even apart from the vital question of national life and regarding only the individual interest of the children themselves happiness in the true sense is a hundredfold more apt to come to any given member of a healthy family of healthy-minded children well brought up well educated but taught that they must shift for themselves must win their own way and by their own exertions make their own positions of usefulness then it is apt to come to those whose parents themselves have acted on and have trained their children to act on the selfish and sordid theory that the whole end of life is to taste a few good things the intelligence of the remark is on a par with its morality for the most rudimentary mental process would have shown the speaker that if the average family in which there are children contained but two children the nation as a whole would decrease in population so rapidly that in two or three generations it would very deservedly be on the point of extinction so that the people who had acted on this base and selfish doctrine would be giving place to others with braver and more robust ideals. Nor would such a result be in any way regrettable for a race that practiced such doctrine, that is, a race that practiced race suicide, would thereby conclusively show that it was unfit to exist and that it had better give place to people who had not forgotten the primary laws of their being. To sum up, then, the whole matter is simple enough. If either a race or an individual prefers the pleasure of more effortless ease, of self-indulgence, to the infinitely deeper, the infinitely higher pleasures that come to those who know the toil and the weariness, but also the joy of hard duty well done, why, that race or that individual must inevitably in the end pay the penalty of leading a life both vapid and ignoble. No man and no woman really worthy of the name, 
can care for the life spent solely or chiefly in the avoidance of risk and trouble and labor. Save in exceptional cases, the prizes worth having in life must be paid for, and the life worth living must be a life of work for a worthy end, and ordinarily of work more for others than for one's self. The woman's task is not easy. No task worth doing is easy. But in doing it, and when she has done it, there shall come to her the highest and holiest joy known to mankind. And having done it, she shall have the reward prophesied in Scripture. For her husband and her children, yes, and all people who realize that her work lies at the foundation of all national happiness and greatness, shall rise up and call her blessed. End of section 39, recording by Paul Adams, www.yawnguy.com. Section 40 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adams. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Asenwein. Section 40. Appendix D. Speeches for Study and Practice. Alton B. Parker, The Call to Democrats. From a speech opening the National Democratic Convention at Baltimore, Maryland, June 1912. It is not the wild and cruel methods of revolution and violence that are needed to correct the abuses incident to our government as to all things human. Neither material nor moral progress lies that way. We have made our government and our complicated institutions by appeals to reason, seeking to educate all our people that day after day, year after year, century after century, they may see more clearly, act more justly, become more and more attached to the fundamental ideas that underlie our society. If we are to preserve undiminished the heritage bequeathed us and add to it those accretions without which society would perish, we shall need all the powers that the school, the church, the court, the deliberative assembly, and the quiet thought of our people can bring to bear. We are called upon to do battle against the unfaithful guardians of our constitution and liberties and the hordes of ignorance which are pushing forward only to the ruin of our social and governmental fabric. Too long has the country endured the offenses of the leaders of a party which once knew greatness. Too long have we been blind to the bacchanal of corruption. Too long have we listlessly watched the assembling of the forces that threaten our country and our firesides. The time has come when the salvation of the country demands the restoration to place and power of men of high ideals who will wage unceasing war against corruption in politics, who will enforce the law against both rich and poor, and who will treat guilt as personal and punish it accordingly. What is our duty? To think alike as to men and measures? Impossible, even for our great party. There is not a reactionary among us. All Democrats are progressives. But it is inevitably human that we shall not all agree that in a single highway is found the only road to progress, or each make the same man of all our worthy candidates his first choice. It is possible, however, and it is our duty to put aside all selfishness, to consent cheerfully that the majority shall speak for each of us, and to march out of this convention shoulder to shoulder, intoning the praises of our chosen leader. And that will be his due, whichever of the honorable and able men now claiming our attention shall be chosen. 
End of section 40. Recording by Paul Adams. www.yawnguy.com Section 41 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adams. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Asenwein. Section 41. Appendix D. Speeches for Study and Practice. John W. Westcott. Nominating Woodrow Wilson at the National Democratic Convention, Baltimore, Maryland, June 1912. The New Jersey delegation is commissioned to represent the great cause of democracy and to offer you, as its militant and triumphant leader, a scholar, not a charlatan, a statesman, not a doctrinaire, a profound lawyer, not a splitter of legal hairs, a political economist, not an egotistical theorist, a practical politician who constructs, modifies, restrains, without disturbance and destruction, a resistless debater and consummate master of statement, not a mere sophist, a humanitarian, not a defamer of characters and lives, a man whose mind is at once cosmopolitan and composite of America, a gentleman of unpretentious habits, with the fear of God in his heart and the love of mankind exhibited in every act of his life, above all, a public servant who has been tried to the uttermost and never found wanting, matchless, unconquerable, the ultimate Democrat, Woodrow Wilson. New Jersey has reasons for her course. Let us not be deceived in our premises. Campaigns of vilification, corruption, and false pretense have lost their usefulness. The evolution of national energy is towards a more intelligent morality in politics and in all other relations. The situation admits of no compromise. The temper and purpose of the American public will tolerate no other view. The indifference of the American people to politics has disappeared. Any platform and any candidate not conforming to this vast social and commercial behest will go down to ignominious defeat at the polls. Men are known by what they say and do. They are known by those who hate and oppose them. Many years ago, Woodrow Wilson said, No man is great who thinks himself so, and no man is good who does not try to secure the happiness and comfort of others. This is the secret of his life. The deeds of this moral and intellectual giant are known to all men. They accord not with the shams and false pretenses of politics, but make national harmony with the millions of patriots determined to correct the wrongs of plutocracy and re-establish the maxims of American liberty in all their regnant beauty and practical effectiveness. New Jersey loves Woodrow Wilson, not for the enemies he has made. New Jersey loves him for what he is. New Jersey argues that Woodrow Wilson is the only candidate who can not only make democratic success a certainty, but secure the electoral vote of almost every state in the Union. New Jersey will endorse his nomination by a majority of 100,000 of the liberated citizens. We're not building for a day or even a generation, but for all time. New Jersey believes that there is an omniscience in national instinct. That instinct centers in Woodrow Wilson. He has been in political life less than two years. He has had no organization, only a practical ideal, the reestablishment of equal opportunity. Not his deeds alone, not his immortal words alone, not his personality alone, not his matchless powers alone, but all combined compel national faith and confidence in him. 
Every crisis evolves its master. Time and circumstance have evolved Woodrow Wilson. The North, the South, the East, and the West unite in him. New Jersey appeals to this convention to give the nation Woodrow Wilson, that he may open the gates of opportunity to every man, woman, and child under our flag. By reforming abuses and thereby teaching them, in his matchless words, to release their energies intelligently, that peace, justice, and prosperity may reign. New Jersey rejoices, through her freely chosen representatives, to name for the Presidency of the United States the Princeton Schoolmaster Woodrow Wilson. End of section 41. Recording by Paul Adams, www.yongai.com. Section 42 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adams. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Asenwein. Section 42. Appendix D. Speeches for Study and Practice. Henry W. Grady. The Race Problem. Delivered at the annual banquet of the Boston Merchants Association at Boston, Massachusetts, December 12, 1889. Mr. President, bidden by your invitation to a discussion of the race problem, forbidden by occasion to make a political speech, I appreciate, in trying to reconcile orders with propriety, the perplexity of the little maid who, bidden to learn to swim, was yet adjured. Now go, my darling, hang your clothes on a hickory limb, and don't go near the water. The stoutest apostle of the church, they say, is the missionary, and the missionary, wherever he unfurls his flag, will never find himself in deeper need of unction and address than I, bidden tonight to plant the standard of a southern democrat in Boston's banquet hall and to discuss the problem of the races in the home of Phillips and of Sumner. But, Mr. President, if a purpose to speak in perfect frankness and sincerity, if earnest understanding of the vast interests involved, if a consecrating sense of what disaster may follow, further misunderstanding and estrangement, if these may be counted upon to steady undisciplined speech and to strengthen an untried arm, then, sir, I shall find the courage to proceed. Happy am I that this mission has brought my feet at last to press New England's historic soil, and my eyes to the knowledge of her beauty and her thrift. Here, within touch of Plymouth Rock and Bunker Hill, where Webster thundered and Longfellow sang, Emerson thought and Channing preached, here, in the cradle of American letters and almost of American liberty, I hasten to make the obeisance that every American owes New England when first he stands uncovered in her mighty presence. Strange apparition! This stern and unique figure, carved from the ocean and the wilderness, its majesty kindling and growing amid the storms of winter and of wars, until at last the gloom was broken, its beauty disclosed in the sunshine, and the heroic workers rested at its base. While startled kings and emperors gazed and marveled that from the rude touch of this handful, cast on a bleak and unknown shore, should have come the embodied genius of human government, and the perfected model of human liberty. God bless the memory of those immortal workers, and prosper the fortunes of their living sons, and perpetuate the inspiration of their handiwork. Two years ago, sir, I spoke some words in New York that caught the attention of the North. As I stand here to reiterate, as I have done everywhere, every word I then uttered, to declare that the sentiments I then avowed were universally approved in the South, 
I realize that the confidence begotten by that speech is largely responsible for my presence here tonight. I should dishonor myself if I betrayed that confidence by uttering one insincere word or by withholding one essential element of the truth. Apropos of this last, let me confess, Mr. President, before the praise of New England has died on my lips, that I believe the best product of her present life is the procession of 17,000 Vermont Democrats that for 22 years, undiminished by death, unrecruited by birth or conversion, have marched over their rugged hills, cast their democratic ballots, and gone back home to pray for their unregenerate neighbors and awake to read the record of 26,000 Republican majority. May the God of the helpless and the heroic help them, and may their sturdy tribe increase. Far to the south, Mr. President, separated from this section by a line, once defined in irrepressible difference, once traced in fratricidal blood, and now, thank God, but a vanishing shadow, lies the fairest and richest domain of this earth. It is the home of a brave and hospitable people. There is centered all that can please or prosper humankind. A perfect climate above a fertile soil yields to the husbandman every product of the temperate zone. There by night the cotton whitens beneath the stars, and by day the wheat locks the sunshine in its bearded sheaf. In the same field the clover steals the fragrance of the wind, and tobacco catches the quick aroma of the rains. There are mountains stored with exhaustless treasures, forests vast and primeval, and rivers that, tumbling or loitering, run wanton to the sea. Of the three essential items of all industries, cotton, iron, and wood, that region has easy control. In cotton, a fixed monopoly. In iron, proven supremacy. In timber, the reserve supply of the Republic. From this assured and permanent advantage, against which artificial conditions cannot much longer prevail, has grown an amazing system of industries. Not maintained by human contrivance of tariff or capital, are far off from the fullest and cheapest source of supply, but resting in divine assurance within touch of field and mine and forest, not set amid costly farms from which competition has driven the farmer in despair, but amid cheap and sunny lands, rich with agriculture, to which neither season nor soil has set a limit, this system of industries is mounting to a splendor that shall dazzle and illumine the world. That, sir, is the picture and the promise of my home, a land better and fairer than I have told you, and yet but fit setting in its material excellence for the loyal and gentle quality of its citizenship. Against that, sir, we have New England recruiting the republic from its sturdy loins, shaking from its overcrowded hives new swarms of workers, and touching this land all over with its energy and its courage. And yet, while in the El Dorado of which I have told you, but 15% of its lands are cultivated, its mines scarcely touched, and its population so scant that, were it set equidistant, the sound of the human voice could not be heard from Virginia to Texas, while on the threshold of nearly every house in New England stands a son, seeking, with troubled eyes, some new land in which to carry his modest patrimony. The strange fact remains that in 1880 the South had fewer northern-born citizens than she had in 1870, few in 70 than in 60. Why is this? Why is it, sir, though the section line be now but a mist that the breath may dispel? Fewer men of the north have crossed it over to the south than when it was crimson with the best blood of the republic, or even when the slaveholders stood guard every inch of its way. There can be but one answer. It is the very problem we are now to consider. 
the key that opens that problem will unlock to the world the fairest half of this republic and free the halted feet of thousands whose eyes are already kindling with its beauty better than this it will open the hearts of brothers for thirty years estranged and clasp in lasting comradeship a million hands now withheld in doubt nothing sir but this problem and the suspicions it breeds hinders a clear understanding and a perfect union nothing else stands between us and such love as bound georgia and massachusetts at valley forge and yorktown chastened by the sacrifices of manassas and gettysburg and illumined with the coming of better work and a nobler destiny than was ever wrought with the sword or sought at the cannon's mouth if this does not invite your patient hearing tonight hear one thing more my people your brothers in the south brothers in blood in destiny in all that is best in our past and future are so beset with this problem that their very existence depends on its right solution nor are they wholly to blame for its presence the slave ships of the republic sailed from your ports the slaves worked in our fields you will not defend the traffic nor i the institution but i do here declare that in its wise and humane administration in lifting the slave to heights of which he has not dreamed in his savage home and giving him a happiness he has not yet found in freedom our fathers left their sons a saving and excellent heritage in the storm of war this institution was lost i thank god as heartily as you do that human slavery is gone forever from american soil but the freedman remains with him a problem without precedent or parallel note its appalling conditions two utterly dissimilar races on the same soil with equal political and civil rights almost equal in numbers but terribly unequal in intelligence and responsibility each pledged against fusion one for a century in servitude to the other and freed at last by a desolating war the experiment sought by neither but approached by both with doubt these are the conditions under these adverse at every point we are required to carry these two races in peace and honor to the end never sir has such a task been given to mortal stewardship never before in this republic has the white race divided on the rights of an alien race the red man was cut down as a weed because he hindered the way of the american citizen the yellow man was shut out of this republic because he is an alien and inferior the red man was owner of the land the yellow man was highly civilized and assimilable but they hindered both sections and are gone but the black man affecting but one section is clothed with every privilege of government and pinned to the soil and my people commanded to make good at any hazard and at any cost his full and equal heirship of american privilege and prosperity it matters not that every other race has been routed or excluded without rhyme or reason it matters not that wherever the whites and the blacks have touched in any era or in any clime there has been an irreconcilable violence it matters not that no two races however similar have lived anywhere at any time on the same soil with equal rights in peace in spite of these things we are commanded to make good this change of american policy which has not perhaps changed american prejudice to make certain here what has elsewhere been impossible between whites and blacks and to reverse under the very worst conditions the universal verdict of racial history and driven sir to this superhuman task with an impatience that brooks no delay a rigor that accepts no excuse and a suspicion that discourages frankness and sincerity we do not shrink from this trial it is so interwoven with our industrial fabric that we cannot disentangle it if we would 
so bound up in our honorable obligation to the world that we would not if we could. Can we solve it? The God who gave it into our hands, he alone can know. But this the weakest and wisest of us do know. We cannot solve it with less than your tolerant and patient sympathy, with less than the knowledge that the blood that runs in your veins is our blood, and that, when we have done our best, whether the issue be lost or won, we shall feel your strong arms about us and hear the beating of your approving hearts. The resolute, clear-headed, broad-minded men of the South the men whose genius made glorious every page of the first seventy years of american history whose courage and fortitude you tested in five years of the fiercest war whose energy has made bricks without straw and spread splendor amid the ashes of their war-wasted homes these men wear this problem in their hearts and brains by day and by night they realize as you cannot what this problem means, what they owe to this kindly and dependent race, the measure of their debt to the world, in whose despite they defended and maintained slavery. And though their feet are hindered in its undergrowth, and their march cumbered with its burdens, they have lost neither the patience from which comes clearness, nor the faith from which comes courage. Nor, sir, when in passionate moments is disclosed to them that vague and awful shadow with its lurid abysses and its crimson stains, into which I pray God they may never go, are they struck with more of apprehension than is needed to complete their consecration? Such is the temper of my people. But what of the problem itself? Mr. President, we need not go one step further unless you concede right here that the people I speak for are as honest, as sensible, and as just as your people, seeking as earnestly as you would in their place to rightly solve the problem that touches them at every vital point. If you insist that they are ruffians, blindly striving with bludgeon and shotgun to plunder and oppress a race, and I shall sacrifice my self-respect and tax your patience in vain. But admit that they are men of common sense and common honesty, wisely modifying an environment they cannot wholly disregard, guiding and controlling as best they can the vicious and irresponsible of either race, compensating error with frankness and retrieving in patience what they lost in passion, and conscious all the time that wrong means ruin? Admit this, and we may reach an understanding tonight. The President of the United States, in his late message to Congress, discussing the plea that the South should be left to solve this problem, asks, Are they at work upon it? What solution do they offer? When will the black man cast a free ballot? When will he have the civil rights that are his? I shall not here protest against a partisanry that, for the first time in our history, in time of peace, has stamped with the great seal of our government a stigma upon the people of a great and loyal section. Though I gratefully remember that the great dead soldier who held the helm of state for the eight stormiest years of Reconstruction never found need for such a step, and though there is no personal sacrifice I would not make to remove this cruel and unjust imputation on my people from the archives of my country. But, sir, backed by a record on every page of which is progress, I venture to make earnest and respectful answer to the questions that are asked. We give to the world this year a crop of 7,500,000 bales of cotton, worth $450 million, and its cash equivalent in grain, grasses, and fruit. This enormous crop could not have come from the hands of sullen and discontented labor. It comes from peaceful fields in which laughter and gossip rise above the hum of industry, and contentment runs with a singing plough. 
It is claimed that this ignorant labor is defrauded of its just hire. I present the tax books of Georgia, which show that the Negro 25 years ago a slave has in Georgia alone $10 million of assessed property, worth twice that much. Does not that record honor him and vindicate his neighbors? What people penniless, illiterate has done so well? For every Afro-American agitator stirring the strife in which alone he prospers, I can show you a thousand Negroes, happy in their cabin homes, tilling their own land by day, and at night taking from the lips of their children the helpful message their state sends them from the schoolhouse door. And the schoolhouse itself bears testimony. In Georgia we added last year $250,000 to the school fund, making a total of more than $1 million. And this in the face of prejudice not yet conquered, of the fact that the whites are assessed for $368 million, the blacks for $10 million, and yet 49% of the beneficiaries are black children and in the doubt of many wise men if education helps or can help our problem charleston with her taxable values cut half in two since eighteen sixty pays more in proportion for public schools than boston although it is easier to give much out of much than little out of little the south with one-seventh of the taxable property of the country, with relatively larger debt, having received only one-twelfth as much of public lands, and having back of its tax books none of the five hundred million dollars of bonds that enrich the North, and though it pays annually twenty-six million dollars to your section as pensions, yet gives nearly one-sixth to the public school fund. The South, since 1865, has spent $122 million in education, and this year is pledged to spend $32 million more for state and city schools, although the blacks, paying one-thirtieth of the taxes, get nearly one-half of the fund. Go into our fields and see whites and blacks working side by side on our buildings in the same squad in our shops at the same forge often the blacks crowd the whites from work or lower wages by their greater need and simpler habits and yet are permitted because we want to bar them from no avenue in which their feet are fitted to tread they could not there be elected orators of white universities as they have been here but they do enter there a hundred useful trades that are closed against them here we hold it better and wiser to tend the weeds in the garden than to water the exotic in the window in the south there are negro lawyers teachers editors dentists doctors preachers multiplying with the increased ability of their race to support them in villages and towns they have their military companies equipped from the armories of the state their churches and societies built and supported largely by their neighbors what is the testimony of the courts in penal legislation we have steadily reduced felonies to misdemeanors and have led the world in mitigating punishment for crime that we might save as far as possible this dependent race from its own weakness in our penitentiary record, 60% of the prosecutions are Negroes, and in every court the Negro criminal strikes the colored juror that white men may judge his case. In the North, one Negro in every 185 is in jail. In the South, only one in 446. In the North, the percentage of Negro prisoners is six times as great as that of native whites. In the South, only four times as great. If prejudice wrongs him in Southern courts, the record shows it to be deeper in Northern courts. I assert here, and a bar as intelligent and upright as the bar of Massachusetts will solemnly endorse my assertion, that in the Southern courts, from highest to lowest, pleading for life, liberty, or property, the Negro has distinct advantage because he is a Negro, apt to be overreached, oppressed, 
and that this advantage reaches from the juror in making his verdict to the judge in measuring his sentence. Now, Mr. President, can it be seriously maintained that we are terrorizing the people from whose willing hands comes every year one thousand million dollars of farm crops? or have robbed a people who twenty-five years from unrewarded slavery have amassed in one state twenty million dollars of property or that we intend to oppress the people we are arming every day or deceive them when we are educating them to the utmost limit of our ability or outlaw them when we work side by side with them or re-enslave them under legal forms when for their benefit we have even imprudently narrowed the limit of felonies and mitigated the severity of law my fellow countrymen as you yourselves may sometimes have to appeal at the bar of human judgment for justice and for right give to my people tonight the fair and unanswerable conclusion of these incontestable facts but it is claimed that under this fair seeming there is disorder and violence. This I admit, and there will be until there is one ideal community on earth after which we may pattern. But how widely is it misjudged? It is hard to measure with exactness whatever touches the Negro, his helplessness, his isolation, his century of servitude, these dispose us to emphasize and magnify his wrongs. This disposition, inflamed by prejudice and partisanry, has led to injustice and delusion. Lawless men may ravage a county in Iowa, and it is accepted as an incident. In the South, a drunken row is declared to be the fixed habit of the community. Regulators may whip vagabonds in Indiana by platoons, and it scarcely arrests attention. A chance collision in the South among relatively the same classes is gravely accepted as evidence that one race is destroying the other. We might as well claim that the Union was ungrateful to the colored soldier who followed its flag because a Grand Army post in Connecticut closed its door to a Negro veteran as for you to give racial significance to every incident in the south or to accept exceptional grounds as the rule of our society i am not one of those who becloud american honor with the parade of the outrages of either section and belie american character by declaring them to be significant and representative i prefer to maintain that they are neither and stand for nothing but the passion and sin of our poor fallen humanity if society like a machine were no stronger than its weakest part i should despair of both sections but knowing that society sentient and responsible in every fibre can mend and repair until the whole has the strength of the best i despair of neither these gentlemen who come with me here knit into georgia's busy life as they are never saw i dare assert an outrage committed on a negro and if they did no one of you would be swifter to prevent or punish it is through them and the men and women who think with them making nine-tenths of every southern community that these two races have been carried thus far with less of violence than would have been possible anywhere else on earth and in their fairness and courage and steadfastness more than in all the laws that can be passed all the bayonets that can be mustered is the hope of our future when will the blacks cast a free ballot when ignorance anywhere is not dominated by the will of the intelligent when the laborer anywhere casts a vote unhindered by his boss when the vote of the poor anywhere is not influenced by the power of the rich when the strong and the steadfast do not everywhere control the suffrage of the weak and shiftless then and not till then will the ballot of the negro be free the white people of the south abandoned mr president not in prejudice against the blacks not in sectional estrangement not in the hope of political dominion but in a deep and abiding necessity 
Here is this vast, ignorant, and purchasable vote, clannish, credulous, impulsive, and passionate, tempting every art of the demagogue, but insensible to the appeal of the statesman, wrongly started in that it was led into alienation from its neighbor and taught to rely on the protection of an outside force it cannot be merged and lost in the two great parties through logical currents for it lacks political conviction and even that information on which conviction must be based it must remain a faction strong enough in every community to control on the slightest division of the whites under that division it becomes the prey of the cunning and unscrupulous of both parties its credulity is imposed upon its patience inflamed its cupidity tempted its impulses misdirected and even its superstition made to play its part in a campaign in which every interest of society is jeopardized and every approach to the ballot box debauched it is against such campaigns as this the folly and the bitterness and the danger of which every southern community has drunk deeply that the white people of the south are banded together just as you in massachusetts would be banded if three hundred thousand men not one in a hundred able to read his ballot banded in race instinct holding against you the memory of a century of slavery taught by your late conquerors to distrust and oppose you had already travested legislation from your state house and in every species of folly or villainy had wasted your substance and exhausted your credit but admitting the right of the whites to unite against this tremendous menace we are challenged with the smallness of our vote this has long been flippantly charged to be evidence and has now been solemnly and efficiently declared to be proof of political turpitude and baseness on our part let us see virginia a state now under fierce assault for this alleged crime cast in eighteen eighty eight seventy five per cent of her vote massachusetts the state in which i speak sixty per cent of her vote was it suppression in Virginia and natural causes in Massachusetts? Last month, Virginia cast 69% of her vote, and Massachusetts, fighting in every district, cast only 49% of hers. If Virginia is condemned because 31% of her vote was silent, how shall this state escape, in which 51% was dumb? Let us enlarge this comparison. The sixteen southern states in eighty eight cast sixty seven per cent of their total vote, the six New England states but sixty three per cent of theirs. By what fair rule shall the stigma be put upon one section while the other escapes? A congressional election in New York last week, with the polling place in touch of every voter, brought out only six thousand votes of twenty eight thousand and the lack of opposition is assigned as the natural cause. In a district in my state, in which an opposition speech has not been heard in ten years, and the polling places are miles apart, under the unfair reasoning of which my section has been a constant victim, the small vote is charged to be proof of forcible suppression. In Virginia, an average majority of 12,000, and less hopeless division of the minority, was raised to 42,000. In Iowa, in the same election, a majority of 32,000 was wiped out, and an opposition majority of 8,000 was established. The change of 40,000 votes in Iowa is accepted as political revolution. In Virginia, an increase of 30,000 on a safe majority is declared to be proof of political fraud. It is deplorable, sir, that in both sections a larger percentage of the vote is not regularly cast, but more inexplicable that this should be so in New England than in the South. What invites the Negro to the ballot box? He knows that of all men it has promised him most and yielded him least. His first appeal to suffrage was the promise of forty acres and a mule. His second, the threat that democratic success meant his re-enslavement. 
Both have been proved false in his experience. He looked for a home, and he got the Freedman's Bank. He fought under promise of the loaf, and in victory was denied the crumbs. Discouraged and deceived, he has realized at last that his best friends are his neighbors, with whom his lot is cast, and whose prosperity is bound up in his, and that he has gained nothing in politics to compensate the loss of their confidence and sympathy. That is at last his best and enduring hope. And so, without leaders or organization, and lacking the resolute heroism of my party friends in Vermont that make their hopeless march over the hills a high and inspiring pilgrimage, he shrewdly measures the occasional agitator, balances his little account with politics, touches up his mule, and jogs down the furrow, letting the mad world wag as it will. The Negro voter can never control in the South, and it would be well if partisans at the North would understand this. I have seen the white people of a state set about by black hosts until their fate seemed sealed. But, sir, some brave men, banding them together, would rise as Elisha rose in beleaguered Samaria, and, touching their eyes with faith, bid them look abroad to see the very air filled with the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. If there is any human force that cannot be withstood, it is the power of the banded intelligence and responsibility of a free community. Against it, numbers and corruption cannot prevail. It cannot be forbidden in the law or divorced in force. It is the inalienable right of every free community, the just and righteous safeguard against an ignorant or corrupt suffrage. It is on this, sir, that we rely in the South, not the cowardly menace of mask or shotgun, but the peaceful majesty of intelligence and responsibility, massed and unified for the protection of its homes and the preservation of its liberty. That, sir, is our reliance and our hope, and against it all the powers of earth shall not prevail. It is just as certain that Virginia would come back to the unchallenged control of a white race that before the moral and material power of her people once more unified, opposition would crumble until its last desperate leader was left alone, vainly striving to rally his disordered hosts, as that night should fade in the kindling glory of the sun. You may pass false bills, but they will not avail. You may surrender your own liberties to federal election law. You may submit, in fear of a necessity that does not exist, that the very form of this government may be changed. You may invite federal interference with the New England town meeting that has been for a hundred years the guarantee of local government in America. This old state, which holds in its charter the boast that it is a free and independent commonwealth, may deliver its election machinery into the hands of the government it helped to create. But never, sir, will a single state of this union, north or south, be delivered again to the control of an ignorant and inferior race. We wrested our state governments from Negro supremacy when the federal drumbeat rolled closer to the ballot box and federal bayonets hedged it deeper about than will ever again be permitted in this free government. But, sir, though the cannon of this republic thundered in every voting district in the South, we still should find in the mercy of God the means and the courage to prevent its re-establishment. I regret, sir, that my section, hindered with this problem, stands in seeming estrangement to the North, if, sir, any man will point out to me a path down which the white people of the South, divided, may walk in peace and honor, I will take that path, though I take it alone, for at its end, and nowhere else I fear, is to be found the full prosperity of my section and the full restoration of this union. But, sir, if the Negro had not been enfranchised, the South would have been divided and the Republic united. His enfranchisement, against which I enter no protest, 
holds the South united and compact. What solution then can we offer for the problem? Time alone can disclose it to us. We simply report progress and ask your patience. If the problem be solved at all, and I firmly believe it will, though nowhere else has it been, it will be solved by the people most deeply bound in interest, most deeply pledged in honor to its solution. I had rather see my people render back this question rightly solved than to see them gather all the spoils over which faction has contended since Catiline conspired and Caesar fought. Meantime, we treat the Negro fairly, measuring to him justice in the fullness the strong should give to the weak and leading him in the steadfast ways of citizenship that he may no longer be the prey of the unscrupulous and the sport of the thoughtless we open to him every pursuit in which he can prosper and seek to broaden his training and capacity we seek to hold his confidence and friendship and to pin him to the soil with ownership that he may catch in the fire of his own hearthstone that sense of responsibility the shiftless can never know and we gather him into that alliance of intelligence and responsibility that though it now runs close to racial lines welcomes the responsible and intelligent of any race by this course confirmed in our judgment and justified in the progress already made we hope to progress slowly but surely to the end the love we feel for that race you cannot measure nor comprehend as i attested here the spirit of my old black mammy from her home up there looks down to bless and through the tumult of this night steals the sweet music of her croonings as thirty years ago she held me in her black arms and led me smiling to sleep this scene vanishes as i speak and i catch a vision of an old southern home with its lofty pillars and its white pigeons fluttering down through the golden air i see women with strained and anxious faces and children alert yet helpless i see night come down with its dangers and its apprehensions and in a big homely room i feel on my tired head the touch of loving hands now worn and wrinkled but fairer to me yet than the hands of mortal woman and stronger yet to lead me than the hands of mortal man as they lay a mother's blessing there while at her knees the truest auto i yet have found i thank god that she is safe in her sanctuary because her slaves sentinel in the silent cabin or guard at her chamber door put a black man's loyalty between her and danger i catch another vision the crisis of battle a soldier struck staggering fallen I see a slave scuffing through the smoke, winding his black arms about the fallen form, reckless of hurtling death, bending his trusty face to catch the words that tremble on the stricken lips, so wrestling meantime with agony that he would lay down his life in his master's stead. I see him by the weary bedside, ministering with uncomplaining patience, praying with all his humble heart that God will lift his master up until death comes in mercy and in honor to still the soldier's agony and seal the soldier's life. I see him by the open grave, mute, motionless, uncovered, suffering for the death of him who in life fought against his freedom. I see him when the mold is heaped and the great drama of his life is closed, turn away and with downcast eyes and uncertain step start out into new and strange fields, faltering, struggling, but moving on until his shambling figure is lost in the light of this better and brighter day. And from the grave comes a voice saying, follow him put your arms about him in his need even as he put his about me be his friend as he was mine and out into this new world strange to me as to him dazzling bewildering both i follow 
and may God forget my people when they forget these. Whatever the future may hold for them, whether they plod along in the servitude from which they have never been lifted since the Cyrenian was laid hold upon by the Roman soldiers and made to bear the cross of the fainting Christ, whether they find homes again in Africa and thus hasten the prophecy of the psalmist who said, And suddenly Ethiopia shall hold out her hands unto God, whether forever dislocated and separate, they remain a weak people, beset by stronger, and exist, as the Turk, who lives in the jealousy, rather than in the conscience of Europe, or whether in this miraculous republic they break through the cast of twenty centuries and, belying universal history, reach the full stature of citizenship, and in peace maintain it, we shall give them uttermost justice, and abiding friendship. And whatever we do, unto whatever seeming estrangement we may be driven, nothing shall disturb the love we bear this republic, or mitigate our consecration to its service. I stand here, Mr. President, to profess no new loyalty. When General Lee, whose heart was the temple of our hopes, and whose arm was clothed with our strength, renewed his allegiance to this government at Appomattox. He spoke from a heart too great to be false, and he spoke for every honest man from Maryland to Texas. From that day to this, Hamilcar has nowhere in the South sworn young Hannibal to hatred and vengeance, but everywhere to loyalty and to love. Witness the veteran standing at the base of a Confederate monument, above the graves of his comrades, his empty sleeve tossing in the April wind, adjuring the young men about him to serve as earnest and loyal citizens the government against which their fathers fought. This message, delivered from that sacred presence, has gone home to the hearts of my fellows. And, sir, I declare here, if physical courage be always equal to human aspiration, that they would die, sir, if need be, to restore this republic their fathers fought to dissolve. Such, Mr. President, is this problem as we see it. Such is the temper in which we approach it. Such the progress made. What do we ask of you? First, patience. Out of this alone can come perfect work. Second, confidence. In this alone can you judge fairly. Third, sympathy. In this you can help us best. Fourth, give us your sons as hostages. When you plant your capital in millions, send your sons that they may know how true are our hearts and may help to swell the Caucasian current until it can carry without danger this black infusion. Fifth, loyalty to the Republic, for there is sectionalism in loyalty as in estrangement. This hour little needs the loyalty that is loyal to one section and yet holds the other in enduring suspicion and estrangement. Give us the broad and perfect loyalty that loves and trusts Georgia alike with Massachusetts, that knows no South, no North, no East, no West, but endears with equal and patriotic love every foot of our soil, every state of our Union. A mighty duty, sir, and a mighty inspiration impels every one of us tonight to lose in patriotic consecration whatever estranges, whatever divides. We, sir, are Americans, and we stand for human liberty. The uplifting force of the American idea is under every throne on earth. France, Brazil, these are our victories. To redeem the earth from kingcraft and oppression, this is our mission, and we shall not fail. God has sown in our soil the seed of his millennial harvest, and he will not lay the sickle to the ripening crop until his full and perfect day has come. Our history, sir, has been a constant and expanding miracle from Plymouth Rock and Jamestown all the way, aye, even from the hour when from the voiceless and traceless ocean a new world rose to the sight of the inspired sailor. 
as we approach the fourth centennial of that stupendous day when the old world will come to marvel and to learn amid our gathered treasures let us resolve to crown the miracles of our past with the spectacle of a republic compact united indissoluble in the bonds of love loving from the lakes to the gulf the wounds of war healed in every heart as on every hill serene and resplendent at the summit of human achievement and earthly glory blazing out the path and making clear the way up which all the nations of the earth must come in god's appointed time End of section 42. Recording by Paul Adams, www.yawnguy.com. Section 43 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings from the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adams. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Asenwein. Section 43, Appendix D, Speeches for Study and Practice. William McKinley, Last Speech. Delivered at the World's Fair, Buffalo, New York, on September 5, 1901, the day before he was assassinated. I am glad again to be in the city of Buffalo and exchange greetings with her people, to whose generous hospitality I am not a stranger, and with whose good will I have been repeatedly and signally honored. Today I have additional satisfaction in meeting and giving welcome to the foreign representatives assembled here whose presence and participation in this exposition have contributed in so marked a degree to its interest and success. To the Commissioners of the Dominion of Canada and the British Colonies, the French Colonies, the Republics of Mexico and of Central and South America, and the Commissioners of Cuba and Puerto Rico, who share with us in this undertaking, we give the hand of fellowship and felicitate with them upon the triumphs of art, science, education, and manufacture which the old has bequeathed to the new century. Expositions are the timekeepers of progress. They record the world's advancement. They stimulate the energy, enterprise, and intellect of the people and quicken human genius. They go into the home. They broaden and brighten the daily life of the people. They open mighty storehouses of information to the student. Every exposition, great or small, has helped to some onward step. Comparison of ideas is always educational and, as such, instructs the brain and hand of man. Friendly rivalry follows, which is the spur to industrial improvement, the inspiration to useful invention, and to high endeavor in all departments of human activity. It exacts a study of the wants, comforts, and even the whims of the people, and recognizes the efficacy of high quality and low prices to win their favor. The quest for trade is an incentive to men of business to devise, invent, improve, and economize in the cost of production. Business life, whether among ourselves or with other peoples, is ever a sharp struggle for success. It will be none the less in the future. Without competition, we would be clinging to the clumsy and antiquated process of farming and manufacture and the methods of business of long ago, and the twentieth would be no further advanced than the eighteenth century. But though commercial competitors we are, commercial enemies we must not be. The Pan-American Exposition has done its work thoroughly, presenting in its exhibits evidences of the highest skill and illustrating the progress of the human family in the Western Hemisphere. This portion of the earth has no cause for humiliation for the part it has performed in the march of civilization. It has not accomplished everything, far from it. 
it has simply done its best and without vanity or boastfulness and recognizing the manifold achievements of others it invites the friendly rivalry of all the powers in the peaceful pursuits of trade and commerce and will cooperate with all in advancing the highest and best interests of humanity the wisdom and energy of all the nations are none too great for the world work the success of art science industry and invention is an international asset and a common glory after all how near one to the other is every part of the world modern inventions have brought into close relation widely separated peoples and make them better acquainted geographic and political divisions will continue to exist but distances have been effaced swift ships and fast trains are becoming cosmopolitan they invade fields which a few years ago were impenetrable the world's products are exchanged as never before and with increasing transportation facilities come increasing knowledge and larger trade prices are fixed with mathematical precision by supply and demand the world's selling prices are regulated by market and crop reports we travel greater distances in a shorter space of time and with more ease than was ever dreamed of by the fathers isolation is no longer possible or desirable the same important news is read though in different languages the same day in all christendom the telegraph keeps us advised of what is occurring everywhere and the press foreshadows with more or less accuracy the plans and purposes of the nations market prices of products and of securities are hourly known in every commercial mart and the investments of the people extend beyond their own national boundaries into the remotest parts of the earth vast transactions are conducted and international exchanges are made by the tick of the cable every event of interest is immediately bulletined the quick gathering and transmission of news like rapid transit are of recent origin and are only made possible by the genius of the inventor and the courage of the investor it took a special messenger of the government with every facility known at the time for rapid travel nineteen days to go from the city of washington to new orleans with a message to general jackson that the war with england had ceased and a treaty of peace had been signed how different now we reached general miles in puerto rico and he was able through the military telegraph to stop his army on the firing line with the message that the united states and spain had signed a protocol suspending hostilities we knew almost instanter of the first shots fired at san diego and the subsequent surrender of the spanish forces was known at washington within less than an hour of its consummation the first ship of Severus' fleet had hardly emerged from that historic harbor when the fact was flashed to our capital, and the swift destruction that followed was announced immediately through the wonderful medium of telegraphy. So accustomed are we to safe and easy communication with distant lands that its temporary interruption, even in ordinary times, results in loss and inconvenience we shall never forget the days of anxious waiting and suspense when no information was permitted to be sent from pekin and the diplomatic representatives of the nations in china cut off from all communication inside and outside of the walled capital were surrounded by an angry and misguided mob that threatened their lives nor the joy that thrilled the world when a single message from the government of the united states brought through our minister the first news of the safety of the besieged diplomats at the beginning of the nineteenth century there was not a mile of steam railroad on the globe now there are enough miles to make its circuit many times then there was not a line of electric telegraph now we have a vast mileage traversing all lands and seas god and man have linked the nations together
no nation can longer be indifferent to any other and as we are brought more and more in touch with each other the less occasion is there for misunderstandings and the stronger the disposition when we have differences to adjust them in the court of arbitration which is the noblest forum for the settlement of international disputes my fellow citizens trade statistics indicate that this country is in a state of unexampled prosperity the figures are almost appalling they show that we are utilizing our fields and forests and mines and that we are furnishing profitable employment to the millions of working men throughout the united states bringing comfort and happiness to their homes and making it possible to lay by savings for old age and disability that all the people are participating in this great prosperity is seen in every American community and shown by the enormous, unprecedented deposits in our savings banks. Our duty in the care and security of these deposits and their safe investment demands the highest integrity and the best business capacity of those in charge of these depositories of the people's earnings. We have a vast and intricate business, built up through years of toil and struggle, in which every part of the country has its stake, which will not permit of either neglect or of undue selfishness. No narrow, sordid policy will subserve it. The greatest skill and wisdom on the part of manufacturers and producers will be required to hold and increase it our industrial enterprises which have grown to such great proportions affect the homes and occupations of the people and the welfare of the country our capacity to produce has developed so enormously and our products have so multiplied that the problem of more markets requires our urgent and immediate attention only a broad and enlightened policy will keep what we have no other policy will get more. In these times of marvelous business energy and gain, we ought to be looking to the future, strengthening the weak places in our industrial and commercial systems, that we may be ready for any storm or strain. By sensible trade arrangements, which will not interrupt our home production, we shall extend the outlets for our increasing surplus. A system which provides a mutual exchange of commodities is manifestly essential to the continued and healthful growth of our export trade. We must not repose in the fancied security that we can forever sell everything and buy little or nothing. If such a thing were possible, it would not be best for us or for those with whom we deal we should take from our customers such of their products as we can use without harm to our industries and labor reciprocity is the natural outgrowth of our wonderful industrial development under the domestic policy now firmly established what we produce beyond our domestic consumption must have a vent abroad the excess must be relieved through a foreign outlet and we should sell everywhere we can and buy wherever the buying will enlarge our sales and productions and thereby make a greater demand for home labor the period of exclusiveness is past the expansion of our trade and commerce is the pressing problem commercial wars are unprofitable a policy of goodwill and friendly trade relations will prevent reprisals reciprocity treaties are in harmony with the spirit of the times measures of retaliation are not if perchance some of our tariffs are no longer needed for revenue or to encourage and protect our industries at home why should they not be employed to extend and promote our markets abroad then too we have inadequate steamship service new lines of steamships have already been put in commission between the pacific coast ports of the united states and those on the western coasts of mexico and central and south america these should be followed up with direct steamship lines between the western coast of the united states and south american ports 
One of the needs of the times is direct commercial lines from our vast fields of production to the fields of consumption that we have but barely touched. Next in advantage to having the thing to sell is to have the conveyance to carry it to the buyer. We must encourage our merchant marine. We must have more ships. They must be under the American flag, built and manned and owned by Americans. These will not only be profitable in a commercial sense, they will be messengers of peace and amity wherever they go. We must build the Isthmian Canal, which will unite the two oceans and give a straight line of water communication with the western coasts of Central and South America and Mexico. The construction of a Pacific cable cannot be longer postponed. In the furtherance of these objects of national interest and concern, you are performing an important part. This exposition would have touched the heart of that American statesman whose mind was ever alert and thought ever constant for a larger commerce and a truer fraternity of the republics of the new world. His broad American spirit is felt and manifested here. He needs no identification to an assemblage of Americans anywhere. For the name of Blaine is inseparably associated with the Pan-American movement which finds here practical and substantial expression, and which we all hope will be firmly advanced by the Pan-American Congress that assembles this autumn in the capital of Mexico. The good work will go on. It cannot be stopped. Those buildings will disappear. This creation of art and beauty and industry will perish from sight but their influence will remain to make it live beyond its too short living with praises and thanksgiving who can tell the new thoughts that have been awakened the ambitions fired and the high achievements that will be wrought through this exposition gentlemen let us ever remember that our interest is in concord not conflict and that our real eminence rests in the victories of peace, not those of war. We hope that all who are represented here may be moved to higher and nobler efforts for their own and the world's good, and that out of this city may come not only greater commerce and trade for us all, but, more essential than these, relations of mutual respect, confidence, and friendship which will deepen and endure. Our earnest prayer is that God will graciously vouchsafe prosperity, happiness, and peace to all our neighbors, and like blessings to all the peoples and powers of earth. End of section 43. Recording by Paul Adams, www.yawnguy.com. Section 44 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adams. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Asenwein. Section 44, Appendix D, Speeches for Study and Practice. John Hay, Tribute to McKinley. From his memorial address at a joint session of the Senate and House of Representatives on February 27, 1903. For the third time, the Congress of the United States are assembled to commemorate the life and the death of a president slain by the hand of an assassin. The attention of the future historian will be attracted to the features which reappear with startling sameness in all three of these awful crimes. The uselessness, the utter lack of consequence of the act, the obscurity, the insignificance of the criminal, the blamelessness, so far as in our sphere of existence the best of men may be held blameless, of the victim. Not one of our murdered presidents had an enemy in the world. They were all of such preeminent purity of life that no pretext could be given for the attack of passional crime. 
They were all men of democratic instincts who could never have offended the most jealous advocates of equity. They were of kindly and generous nature to whom wrong or injustice was impossible. Of moderate fortune whose slender means nobody could envy. They were men of austere virtue, of tender heart, of eminent abilities, which they had devoted with single minds to the good of the republic. If ever men walked before God and man without blame, it was these three rulers of our people. The only temptation to attack their lives offered was their gentle radiance. To eyes hating the light, that was offense enough. The stupid uselessness of such an infamy affronts the common sense of the world. One can conceive how the death of a dictator may change the political conditions of an empire, how the extinction of a narrowing line of kings may bring in an alien dynasty. But in a well-ordered republic like ours, the ruler may fall, but the state feels no tremor. Our beloved and revered leader is gone but the natural process of our laws provides us a successor identical in purpose and ideals nourished by the same teachings inspired by the same principles pledged by tender affection as well as by high loyalty to carry to completion the immense task committed to his hands and to smite with iron severity every manifestation of that hideous crime which his mild predecessor with his dying breath forgave the sayings of celestial wisdom have no date the words that reach us over two thousand years out of the darkest hour of gloom the world has ever known are true to life today they know not what they do. The blow struck at our dear friend and ruler was as deadly as blind hate could make it, but the blow struck at anarchy was deadlier still. How many countries can join with us in the community of a kindred sorrow? I will not speak of those distant regions where assassination enters into the daily life of government but among the nations bound to us by the ties of familiar intercourse who can forget that wise and mild autocrat who had earned the proud title of the liberator that enlightened and magnanimous citizen whom france still mourns that brave and chivalrous king of italy who only lived for his people and saddest of all that lovely and sorrowing empress whose harmless life could hardly have excited the animosity of a demon against that devilish spirit nothing avails neither virtue nor patriotism nor age nor youth nor conscience nor pity we cannot even say that education is a sufficient safeguard against this baleful evil for most of the wretches whose crimes have so shocked humanity in recent years were men not unlettered who have gone from the common schools through murder to the scaffold the life of william mckinsey was from his birth to his death typically american there is no environment i should say anywhere else in the world which could produce just such a character he was born into that way of life which elsewhere is called the middle class but which in this country is so nearly universal as to make of other classes an almost negligible quantity he was neither rich nor poor neither proud nor humble he knew no hunger he was not sure of satisfying no luxury which could enervate mind or body his parents were sober god-fearing people intelligent and upright without pretension and without humility he grew up in the company of boys like himself wholesome honest self-respecting they looked down on nobody they never felt it possible they could be looked down upon their houses were the homes of probity piety patriotism 
They learned in the admirable school readers of fifty years ago the lessons of heroic and splendid life which have come down from the past. They read in their weekly newspapers the story of the world's progress, in which they were eager to take part, and of the sins and wrongs of civilization with which they burned to do battle. It was a serious and thoughtful time. The boys of that day felt dimly, but deeply, that days of sharp struggle and high achievement were before them. They looked at life with the wondering yet resolute eyes of a young esquire in his vigil of arms. They felt a time was coming when to them should be addressed the stern admonition of the apostle, Quit you like men, be strong. The men who are living today and were young in 1860 will never forget the glory and glamour that filled the earth and the sky when the long twilight of doubt and uncertainty was ending and the time for action had come. A speech by Abraham Lincoln was an event not only of high moral significance but of far-reaching importance. The drilling of a militia company by Ellsworth attracted national attention. The fluttering of the flag in the clear sky drew tears from the eyes of young men. Patriotism, which had been a rhetorical expression, became a passionate emotion in which instinct, logic, and feeling were fused. The country was worth saving. It could be saved only by fire. No sacrifice was too great. The young men of the country were ready for the sacrifice. Come weal, come woe, they were ready. At 17 years of age, William McKinley heard this summons of his country. He was the sort of youth to whom a military life in ordinary times would possess no attractions. His nature was far different from that of the ordinary soldier. He had other dreams of life, its prizes and pleasures, than that of marches and battles. But to his mind there was no choice or question. The banner floating in the morning breeze was the beckoning gesture of his country. The thrilling note of the trumpet called him, him and none other, into the ranks. His portrait in his first uniform is familiar to you all. The short, stocky figure, the quiet, thoughtful face, the deep, dark eyes. It is the face of a lad who could not stay at home when he thought he was needed in the field. He was of the stuff of which good soldiers are made. Had he been ten years older, he would have entered at the head of a company and come out at the head of a division. But he did what he could. He enlisted as a private. He learned to obey. His serious, sensible ways, his prompt, alert efficiency soon attracted the attention of his superiors. He was so faithful in little things that they gave him more and more to do. He was untiring in camp and on the march, swift, cool, and fearless in fight. He left the army with field rank when the war ended, breveted by President Lincoln for gallantry in battle. In coming years, when men seek to draw the moral of our great civil war, nothing will seem to them so admirable in all the history of our two magnificent armies as the way in which the war came to a close. When the Confederate army saw the time had come, they acknowledged the pitiless logic of facts and ceased fighting. When the army of the Union saw it was no longer needed, without a murmur or question, making no terms, asking no return, in the flush of victory and fullness of might, it laid down its arms and melted back into the mass of peaceful citizens. There is no event since the nation was born which has so proved its solid capacity for self-government. Both sections share equally in that crown of glory. They had held a debate of incomparable importance and had fought it out with equal energy. A conclusion had been reached, and it is to the everlasting honor of both sides that they each knew when the war was over and the hour of a lasting peace had struck. 
we may admire the desperate daring of others who prefer annihilation to compromise but the palm of common sense and i will say of enlightened patriotism belongs to the men like grant and lee who knew when they had fought enough for honor and for country so it came naturally about that in 1876 the beginning of the second century of the republic he began by an election to congress his political career thereafter for fourteen years this chamber was his home i use the word advisedly nowhere in the world was he so in harmony with his environment as here nowhere else did his mind work with such full consciousness of its powers the air of debate was native to him here he drank delight of battle with his peers in after days when he drove by this stately pile or when on rare occasions his duty called him here he greeted his old haunts with the affectionate zest of a child of the house during all the last ten years of his life filled as they were with activity and glory he never ceased to be homesick for this hall when he came to the presidency there was not a day when his congressional service was not of use to him probably no other president has been in such full and cordial communion with congress if we may accept lincoln alone mckinley knew the legislative body thoroughly its composition its methods its habit of thought he had the profoundest respect for its authority and an inflexible belief in the ultimate rectitude of its purposes our history shows how surely an executive courts disaster and ruin by assuming an attitude of hostility or distrust to the legislature and on the other hand mckinley's frank and sincere trust and confidence in congress were repaid by prompt and loyal support and cooperation during his entire term of office this mutual trust and regard so essential to the public welfare was never shadowed by a single cloud when he came to the presidency he confronted a situation of the utmost difficulty which might well have appalled a man of less serene and tranquil self-confidence there had been a state of profound commercial and industrial depression from which his friends had said his election would relieve the country our relations with the outside world left much to be desired the feeling between the northern and southern sections of the union was lacking in the cordiality which was necessary to the welfare of both hawaii had asked for annexation and had been rejected by the preceding administration there was a state of things in the caribbean which could not permanently endure our neighbor's house was on fire and there were grave doubts as to our rights and duties in the premises a man either weak or rash either irresolute or headstrong might have brought ruin on himself and incalculable harm to the country the least desirable form of glory to a man of his habitual mood and temper that of successful war was nevertheless conferred upon him by uncontrollable events he felt it must come he deplored its necessity he strained almost a breaking his relations with his friends in order first to prevent and then to postpone it to the latest possible moment but when the die was cast he labored with the utmost energy and ardor and with an intelligence in military matters which showed how much of the soldier still survived in the mature statesman to push forward the war to a decisive close war was an anguish to him he wanted it short and conclusive his merciful zeal communicated itself to his subordinates and the war so long dreaded whose consequences were so momentous ended in a hundred days mr mckinley was re-elected by an overwhelming majority 
there had been little doubt of the result among well-informed people but when it was known a profound feeling of relief and renewal of trust were evident among the leaders of capital and industry not only in this country but everywhere they felt that the immediate future was secure and that trade and commerce might safely push forward in every field of effort and enterprise he felt that the harvest time was come to garner in the fruits of so much planting and culture and he was determined that nothing he might do or say should be liable to the reproach of a personal interest let us say frankly he was a party man he believed the policies advocated by him and his friends counted for much in the country's progress and prosperity he hoped in his second term to accomplish substantial results in the development and affirmation of those policies i spent a day with him shortly before he started on his fateful journey to buffalo never had i seen him higher in hope and patriotic confidence he was gratified to the heart that we had arranged a treaty which gave us a free hand in the isthmus in fancy he saw the canal already built and the argosies of the world passing through it in peace and amity he saw in the immense evolution of american trade the fulfillment of all his dreams the reward of all his labors he was i need not say an ardent protectionist never more sincere and devoted than during those last days of his life he regarded reciprocity as the bulwark of protection not a breach but a fulfillment of the law the treaties which for four years had been preparing under his personal supervision he regarded as ancillary to the general scheme he was opposed to any revolutionary plan of change in the existing legislation he was careful to point out that everything he had done was in faithful compliance with the law itself in that mood of high hope of generous expectation he went to buffalo and there on the threshold of eternity he delivered that memorable speech worthy for its loftiness of tone its blameless morality its breadth of view to be regarded as his testament to the nation through all his pride of country and his joy of its success runs the note of solemn warning as in kipling's noble hymn lest we forget the next day sped the bolt of doom and for a week after in an agony of dread broken by elusive glimpses of hope that our prayers might be answered the nation waited for the end nothing in the glorious life we saw gradually waning was more admirable and exemplary than its close the gentle humanity of his words when he saw his assailant in danger of summary vengeance do not let them hurt him his chivalrous care that the news should be broken gently to his wife the fine courtesy with which he apologized for the damage which his death would bring to the great exhibition and the heroic resignation of his final words it is god's way his will not ours be done were all the instinctive expressions of a nature so lofty and so pure that pride in its nobility at once softened and enhanced the nation's sense of loss the republic grieved over such a son but is proud forever of having produced him after all in spite of its tragic ending his life was extraordinarily happy he had all his days troops of friends the cheer of fame and fruitful labor and he became at last on fortune's crowning slope the pillar of a people's hope the center of a world's desire end of section 44 recording by paul adams www.yornguy.com Section 45 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adams. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Asenwein. Section 45, Appendix D, Speeches for Study and Practice. William Jennings Bryan, The Prince of Peace, 1894. I offer no apology for speaking upon a religious theme, for it is the most universal of all themes. I am interested in the science of government, but I am interested more in religion than in government. I enjoy making a political speech. I have made a good many and shall make more, but I would rather speak on religion than on politics. I commenced speaking on the stump when I was only twenty, but I commenced speaking in the church six years earlier and I shall be in the church even after I am put out of politics. I feel sure of my ground when I make a political speech, but I feel even more certain of my ground when I make a religious speech. If I address you upon the subject of law, I might interest the lawyers. If I discuss the science of medicine, I might interest the physicians. In like manner, merchants might be interested in comments on commerce, and farmers in matters pertaining to agriculture, but no one of these subjects appeals to all. Even the science of government, though broader than any profession or occupation, does not embrace the whole sum of life, and those who think upon it differ so among themselves that I could not speak upon the subject so as to please a part of the audience without displeasing others. While to me the science of government is intensely absorbing, I recognize that the most important things in life lie outside of the realm of government, and that more depends upon what the individual does for himself than upon what the government does or can do for him. Men can be miserable under the best government, and they can be happy under the worst government. Government affects but a part of the life which we live here, and does not deal at all with the life beyond, while religion touches the infinite circle of existence, as well as the small arc of that circle which we spend on earth. No greater theme, therefore, can engage our attention. If I discuss questions of government, I must secure the cooperation of a majority before I can put my ideas into practice. But if, in speaking on religion, I can touch one human heart for good, I have not spoken in vain, no matter how large the majority may be against me. Man is a religious being. The heart instinctively seeks for a god. Whether he worships on the banks of the Ganges, prays with his face upturned to the sun, kneels toward Mecca, or, regarding all space as a temple, communes with the Heavenly Father according to the Christian creed, man is essentially devout. There are honest doubters whose sincerity we recognize and respect, but occasionally I find young men who think it smart to be skeptical. They talk as if it were an evidence of larger intelligence to scoff at creeds and to refuse to connect themselves with churches. They call themselves liberal, as if a Christian were narrow-minded. Some go so far as to assert that the advanced thought of the world has discarded the idea that there is a God. To these young men I desire to address myself. Even some older people profess to regard religion as a superstition, pardonable in the ignorant but unworthy of the educated. Those who hold this view look down with mild contempt upon such as give to religion a definite place in their thoughts and lives. They assume an intellectual superiority, and often take little pains to conceal the assumption. Tolstoy administers to the cultured crowd, the words quoted are his, a severe rebuke when he declares that the religious sentiment rests not upon a superstitious fear of the invisible forces of nature, but upon man's consciousness of his finiteness amid an infinite universe, and of his sinfulness. And this consciousness, the great philosopher adds, man can never outgrow. Tolstoy is right, 
man recognizes how limited are his own powers and how vast is the universe and he leans upon the arm that is stronger than his man feels the weight of his sins and looks for one who is sinless religion has been defined by tolstoy as the relation which man fixes between himself and his god a morality as the outward manifestation of this inward relation every one by the time he reaches maturity has fixed some relation between himself and god and no material change in this relation can take place without a revolution in the man for this relation is the most potent influence that acts upon a human life religion is the foundation of morality in the individual and in the group of individuals materialists have attempted to build up a system of morality upon the basis of enlightened self-interest they would have man figure out by mathematics that it pays him to abstain from wrongdoing they would even inject an element of selfishness into altruism but the moral system elaborated by the materialists has several defects first its virtues are borrowed from moral systems based upon religion all those who are intelligent enough to discuss a system of morality are so saturated with the morals derived from systems resting upon religion that they cannot frame a system resting upon reason alone second as it rests upon argument rather than upon authority the young are not in a position to accept or reject our laws do not permit a young man to dispose of real estate until he is twenty-one why this restraint because his reason is not mature and yet a young man's life is largely molded by the environment of his youth third one never knows just how much of his decision is due to reason and how much is due to passion or to selfish interest passion can dethrone the reason we recognize this in our criminal laws we also recognize the bias of self-interest when we exclude from the jury every man no matter how reasonable or upright he may be who has a pecuniary interest in the result of the trial and fourth one whose morality rests upon a nice calculation of benefits to be secured spends time figuring that he should spend in action those who keep a book account of their good deeds seldom do enough good to justify keeping books. A noble life cannot be built upon an arithmetic. It must be rather like the spring that pours forth constantly of that which refreshes and invigorates. Morality is the power of endurance in man, and a religion which teaches personal responsibility to God gives strength to morality there is a powerful restraining influence in the belief that an all-seeing eye scrutinizes every thought and word and act of the individual there is wide difference between the man who is trying to conform his life to a standard of morality about him and the man who seeks to make his life approximate to a divine standard the former attempts to live up to the standard if it is above him and down to it if it is below him and if he is doing right only when others are looking he is sure to find a time when he thinks he is unobserved and then he takes a vacation and falls one needs the inner strength which comes with the conscious presence of a personal god if those who are thus fortified sometimes yield to temptation how helpless and hopeless must those be who rely upon their own strength alone there are difficulties to be encountered in religion but there are difficulties to be encountered everywhere if christians sometimes have doubts and fears unbelievers have more doubts and greater fears i passed through a period of skepticism when i was in college and I have been glad ever since that I became a member of the church before I left home for college, for it helped me during those trying days. And the college days cover the dangerous period in the young man's life. He is just coming into possession of his powers and feels stronger than he ever feels afterward, and he thinks he knows more than he ever does know. It was at this period that I became confused by the different theories of creation but i examined these theories and found that they all assumed something to begin with 
you can test this for yourselves the nebula hypothesis for instance assumes that matter and force existed matter in particles infinitely fine and each particle separated from every other particle by space infinitely great beginning with this assumption force working on matter according to this hypothesis created a universe well i have a right to assume and i prefer to assume a designer back of the design a creator back of the creation and no matter how long you draw out the process of creation so long as god stands back of it you cannot shake my faith in jehovah in genesis it is written that in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth and i can stand on that proposition until i find some theory of creation that goes farther back than the beginning we must begin with something we must start somewhere and the christian begins with god i do not carry the doctrine of evolution as far as some do i am not yet convinced that man is a lineal descendant of the lower animals i do not mean to find fault with you if you want to accept the theory all i mean to say is that while you may trace your ancestry back to the monkey if you find pleasure or pride in doing so you shall not connect me with your family tree without more evidence than has yet been produced i object to the theory for several reasons first it is a dangerous theory if a man links himself in generations with the monkey it then becomes an important question whether he is going toward him or coming from him and i have seen them going in both directions i do not know of any argument that can be used to prove that man is an improved monkey that may not be used just as well to prove that the monkey is a degenerate man and the latter theory is more plausible than the former it is true that man in some physical characteristics resembles the beast but man has a mind as well as a body and a soul as well as a mind the mind is greater than the body and the soul is greater than the mind and i object to having man's pedigree traced on one third of him only and that the lowest third fairburn in his philosophy of christianity lays down a sound proposition when he says that it is not sufficient to explain man as an animal that it is necessary to explain man in history and the darwinian theory does not do this the ape according to this theory is older than man and yet the ape is still an ape while man is the author of the marvelous civilization which we see about us one does not escape from mystery however by accepting this theory for it does not explain the origin of life when the follower of darwin has traced the germ of life back to the lowest form in which it appears and to follow him one must exercise more faith than religion calls for he finds that scientists differ those who reject the idea of creation are divided into two schools some believing that the first germ of life came from another planet and others holding that it was the result of spontaneous generation each school answers the arguments advanced by the other and as they cannot agree with each other i am not compelled to agree with either if i were compelled to accept one of these theories i would prefer the first for if we can chase the germ of life off this planet and get it out into space we can guess the rest of the way and no one can contradict us but if we accept the doctrine of spontaneous generation we cannot explain why spontaneous generation ceased to act after the first germ was created go back as far as we may we cannot escape from the creative act and it is just as easy for me to believe that god created man as he is as to believe that millions of years ago he created a germ of life and endowed it with power to develop into all that we see today i object to the darwinian theory until more conclusive proof is produced because i fear we shall lose the consciousness of god's presence in our daily life if we must accept the theory that through all the ages no spiritual force has touched the life of man or shaped the destiny of nations but there is another objection the darwinian theory represents man as reaching his present perfection by the operation of the law of hate 
the merciless law by which the strong crowd out and kill off the weak if this is the law of our development then if there is any logic that can bind the human mind we shall turn backward toward the beast in proportion as we substitute the law of love i prefer to believe that love rather than hatred is the law of development how can hatred be the law of development when nations have advanced in proportion as they have departed from that law and adopted the law of love but i repeat while i do not accept the darwinian theory i shall not quarrel with you about it i only refer to it to remind you that it does not solve the mystery of life or explain human progress i fear that some have accepted it in the hope of escaping from the miracle but why should the miracle frighten us and yet i am inclined to think that it is one of the test questions with the christian christ cannot be separated from the miraculous his birth his ministrations and his resurrection all involve the miraculous and the change which his religion works in the human heart is a continuing miracle eliminate the miracles and christ becomes merely a human being and his gospel is stripped of divine authority the miracle raises two questions can god perform a miracle and would he want to the first is easy to answer a god who can make a world can do anything he wants to do with it the power to perform miracles is necessarily implied in the power to create but would god want to perform a miracle this is the question which has given most of the trouble the more i have considered it the less inclined i am to answer in the negative to say that god would not perform a miracle is to assume a more intimate knowledge of god's plans and purposes than i can claim to have i will not deny that god does perform a miracle or may perform one merely because i do not know how or why he does it i find it so difficult to decide each day what god wants done now as i am not presumptuous enough to attempt to declare what god might have wanted to do thousands of years ago the fact that we are constantly learning of the existence of new forces suggests the possibility that god may operate through forces yet unknown to us and the mysteries with which we deal every day warn me that faith is as necessary as sight who would have credited a century ago the stories that are now told of the wonder-working electricity for ages man had known the lightning but only to fear it now this invisible current is generated by a man-made machine imprisoned in a man-made wire and made to do the bidding of man we are even able to dispense with the wire and hurl words through space and the x-ray has enabled us to look through substances which were supposed until recently to exclude all light the miracle is not more mysterious than many of the things with which man now deals it is simply different the miraculous birth of christ is not more mysterious than any other conception it is simply unlike it nor is the resurrection of christ more mysterious than the myriad resurrections which mark each annual seed time it is sometimes said that god could not suspend one of his laws without stopping the universe but do we not suspend or overcome the law of gravitation every day every time we move a foot or lift a weight we temporarily overcome one of the most universal of natural laws and yet the world is not disturbed science has taught us so many things that we are tempted to conclude that we know everything but there is really a great unknown which is still unexplored and that which we have learned ought to increase our reverence rather than our egotism science has disclosed some of the machinery of the universe but science has not yet revealed to us the great secret the secret of life it is to be found in every blade of grass in every insect in every bird and in every animal as well as in man six thousand years of recorded history and yet we know no more about the secret of life than they knew in the beginning 
we live we plan we have our hopes our fears and yet in a moment a change may come over any one of us and this body will become a mass of lifeless clay what is it that having we live and having not we are as the clod the progress of the race and the civilization which we now behold are the work of men and women who have not yet solved the mystery of their own lives and our food must we understand it before we eat it if we refused to eat anything until we could understand the mystery of its growth we would die of starvation but mystery does not bother us in the dining room it is only in the church that it is a stumbling block i was eating a piece of watermelon some months ago and was struck with its beauty i took some of the seeds and dried them and weighed them and found that it would require some five thousand seeds to weigh a pound and then i applied mathematics to that forty pound melon one of these seeds put into the ground when warmed by the sun and moistened by the rain takes off its coat and goes to work it gathers from somewhere two hundred thousand times its own weight and forcing this raw material through a tiny stem constructs a watermelon it ornaments the outside with a covering of green inside the green it puts a layer of white and within the white a core of red and all through the red it scatters seeds each one capable of continuing the work of reproduction where does that little seed get its tremendous power where does it find its coloring matter how does it collect its flavoring extract how does it build a watermelon until you can explain a watermelon do not be too sure that you can set limits to the power of the almighty and say just what he would do or how he would do it i cannot explain the watermelon but i eat it and enjoy it the egg is the most universal of foods and its use dates from the beginning but what is more mysterious than an egg when an egg is fresh it is an important article of merchandise a hen can destroy its market value in a week's time but in two weeks more she can bring forth from it what man could not find in it we eat eggs but we cannot explain an egg water has been used from the birth of man we learned after it has been used for ages that it is merely a mixture of gases but it is far more important that we have water to drink than that we know that it is not water everything that grows tells a like story of infinite power why should i deny that a divine hand fed a multitude with a few loaves and fishes when i see hundreds of millions fed every year by a hand which converts the seeds scattered over the field into an abundant harvest we know that food can be multiplied in a few months time shall we deny the power of the creator to eliminate the element of time when we have gone so far in eliminating the element of space who am i that i should attempt to measure the arm of the almighty with my puny arm or to measure the brain of the infinite with my finite mind who am i that i should attempt to put meats and bounds to the power of the creator but there is something even more wonderful still the mysterious change that takes place in the human heart when a man begins to hate the things he loved and to love the things he hated the marvelous transformation that takes place in the man who before the change would have sacrificed a world for his own advancement but who after the change would give his life for a principle and esteem it a privilege to make sacrifice for his convictions what greater miracle than this that converts a selfish self-centered human being into a center from which good influences flow out in every direction and yet this miracle has been wrought in the heart of each one of us or may be wrought and we have seen it wrought in the hearts and lives of those about us no living a life that is a mystery and living in the midst of mystery and miracles i shall not allow either to deprive me of the benefits of the christian religion if you ask me if i understand everything in the bible i answer no but if we will try to live up to what we do understand we will be kept so busy doing good that we will not have time to worry about the passages which we do not understand
Some of those who question the miracle also question the theory of atonement. They assert that it does not accord with their idea of justice for one to die for all. Let each one bear his own sins and the punishment due for them, they say. The doctrine of vicarious suffering is not a new one. It is as old as the race. That one should suffer for others is one of the most familiar of principles, and we see the principle illustrated every day of our lives. Take the family, for instance. From the day the mother's first child is born, for twenty or thirty years, her children are scarcely out of her waking thoughts. Her life trembles in the balance at each child's birth. She sacrifices for them. She surrenders herself to them. Is it because she expects them to pay her back? Fortunate for the parent and fortunate for the child if the latter has an opportunity to repay in part the debt it owes. But no child can compensate a parent for a parent's care. In the course of nature, the debt is paid, not to the parent, but to the next generation. And the next, each generation suffering, sacrificing for, and surrendering itself to the generation that follows. This is the law of our lives. Nor is this confined to the family. Every step in civilization has been made possible by those who have been willing to sacrifice for posterity freedom of speech freedom of the press freedom of conscience and free government have all been won for the world by those who were willing to labor unselfishly for their fellows so well established is this doctrine that we do not regard anyone as great unless he recognizes how important his life is in comparison with the problems with which he deals I find proof that man was made in the image of his creator, in the fact that, throughout the centuries, man has been willing to die, if necessary, that blessings denied to him might be enjoyed by his children, his children's children, and the world. The seeming paradox, he that saveth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it, has an application wider than that usually given to it. It is an epitome of history. Those who live only for themselves live little lives, but those who stand ready to give themselves for the advancement of things greater than themselves find a larger life than the one they would have surrendered. Wendell Phillips gave expression to the same idea when he said, What imprudent men the benefactors of the race have been! How prudently most men sink into nameless graves, while now and then a few forget themselves into immortality! We win immortality, not by remembering ourselves, but by forgetting ourselves in devotion to things larger than ourselves. Instead of being an unnatural plan, the plan of salvation is in perfect harmony with human nature as we understand it. Sacrifice is the language of love, and Christ, in suffering for the world, adopted the only means of reaching the heart. This can be demonstrated not only by theory, but by experience, for the story of his life, his teachings, his sufferings, and his death has been translated into every language and everywhere it has touched the heart. But if I were going to present an argument in favor of the divinity of Christ, I would not begin with miracles or mystery or with the theory of atonement. I would begin as Carnegie Simpson does in his book entitled The Fact of Christ. Commencing with the undisputed fact that Christ lived, he points out that one cannot contemplate this fact without feeling that in some way it is related to those now living. He says that one can read of Alexander, of Caesar, or of Napoleon, and not feel that it is a matter of personal concern, but that when one reads that Christ lived, and how he lived, and how he died, he feels that somehow there is a cord that stretches from that life to his. As he studies the character of Christ, he becomes conscious of certain virtues which stand out in bold relief his purity his forgiving spirit and his unfathomable love the author is correct christ presents an example of purity in thought and life 
and man conscious of his own imperfections and grieved over his shortcomings finds inspiration in the fact that he was tempted in all points like as we are and yet without sin i am not sure but that each can find just here a way of determining for himself whether he possesses the true spirit of a christian if the sinlessness of christ inspires within him an earnest desire to conform his life more nearly to the perfect example he is indeed a follower if on the other hand he resents the reproof which the purity of christ offers and refuses to mend his ways he has yet to be born again the most difficult of all the virtues to cultivate is the forgiving spirit revenge seems to be natural with man it is human to want to get even with an enemy it has even been popular to boast of vindictiveness it was once inscribed on a man's monument that he had repaid both friends and enemies more than he had received this was not the spirit of christ he taught forgiveness and in that incomparable prayer which he left as model for our petitions he made our willingness to forgive the measure by which we may claim forgiveness he not only taught forgiveness but he exemplified his teachings in his life when those who persecuted him brought him to the most disgraceful of all deaths his spirit of forgiveness rose above his sufferings and he prayed father forgive them for they know not what they do but love is the foundation of christ's creed the world had known love before parents had loved their children and children their parents husbands had loved their wives and wives their husbands and friend had loved friend but jesus gave a new definition of love his love was as wide as the sea its limits were so far flung that even an enemy could not travel beyond its bounds other teachers sought to regulate the lives of their followers by rule and formula but christ's plan was to purify the heart and then to leave love to direct the footsteps what conclusion is to be drawn from the life the teachings and the death of this historic figure reared in a carpenter's shop with no knowledge of literature save bible literature with no acquaintance with philosophers living or with the writings of sages dead when only about thirty years old he gathered disciples about him promulgated a higher code of morals than the world had ever known before and proclaimed himself the messiah he taught and performed miracles for a few brief months and then was crucified his disciples were scattered and many of them put to death his claims were disputed his resurrection denied and his followers persecuted and yet from this beginning his religion spread until hundreds of millions have taken his name with reverence upon their lips and millions have been willing to die rather than surrender the faith which he put within their hearts how should we account for him here is the greatest fact of history here is one who has with increasing power for nineteen hundred years molded the hearts the thoughts and the lives of men and he exerts more influence today than ever before what think ye of christ it is easier to believe him divine than to explain in any other way what he said and did and was and I have greater faith, even than before, since I visited the Orient and witnessed the successful contest which Christianity is waging against the religions and philosophies of the East. I was thinking a few years ago of the Christmas which was then approaching, and of him in whose honor the day is celebrated. I recalled the message, Peace on earth, good will to men. And then my thoughts ran back to the prophecy uttered centuries before his birth in which he was described as the prince of peace to reinforce my memory i reread the prophecy and i found immediately following a verse which i had forgotten a verse which declares that of the increase of his peace and government there shall be no end and isaiah adds that he shall judge his people with justice and with judgment 
I had been reading of the rise and fall of nations, and occasionally I had met a gloomy philosopher who preached the doctrine that nations, like individuals, must of necessity have their birth, their infancy, their maturity, and finally their decay and death. But here I read of a government that is to be perpetual, a government of increasing peace and blessedness, the government of the Prince of Peace, and it is to rest on justice. I have thought of this prophecy many times during the last few years, and I have selected this theme that I might present some of the reasons which lead me to believe that Christ has fully earned the right to be called the Prince of Peace a title that will in the years to come be more and more applied to him if he can bring peace to each individual heart and if his creed when applied will bring peace throughout the earth who will deny his right to be called the prince of peace all the world is in search of peace every heart that ever beat has sought for peace and many have been the methods employed to secure it some have thought to purchase it with riches and have labored to secure wealth hoping to find peace when they were able to go where they pleased and buy what they liked of those who have endeavored to purchase peace with money the large majority have failed to secure the money but what has been the experience of those who have been eminently successful in finance they all tell the same story namely that they spent the first half of their lives trying to get money from others and the last half trying to keep others from getting their money and that they found peace in neither half some have even reached the point where they find difficulty in getting people to accept their money and i know of no better indication of the ethical awakening in this country than the increasing tendency to scrutinize the methods of money-making I am sanguine enough to believe that the time will yet come when respectability will no longer be sold to great criminals by helping them to spend their ill-gotten gains. A long step in advance will have been taken when religious, educational, and charitable institutions refuse to condone conscienceless methods in business and leave the possessor of illegitimate accumulations to learn how lonely life is when one prefers money to morals some have sought peace in social distinction but whether they have been within the charmed circle and fearful lest they might fall out or outside and hopeful that they might get in they have not found peace some have thought vain thought to find peace in political prominence but whether office comes by birth as in monarchies or by election as in republics it does not bring peace an office is not considered a high one if all can occupy it only when few in a generation can hope to enjoy an honor do we call it a great honor i am glad that our heavenly father did not make the peace of the human heart to depend upon our ability to buy it with money secure it in society or win it at the polls for in either case but few could have obtained it but when he made peace the reward of a conscience void of offence toward god and man he put it within the reach of all the poor can secure it as easily as the rich the social outcast as freely as the leader of society and the humblest citizen equally with those who wield political power to those who have grown gray in the church i need not speak of the peace to be found in faith in god and trust in an overruling providence christ taught that our lives are precious in the sight of god and poets have taken up the thought and woven it into immortal verse no uninspired writer has expressed it more beautifully than william cullen bryant in his ode to a waterfowl after following the wanderings of the bird of passage as it seeks first its southern and then its northern home he concludes thou art gone the abyss of heaven hath swallowed up thy form but on my heart deeply hath sunk the lesson thou hast given and shall not soon depart he who from zone to zone guides through the boundless sky thy certain flight in the long way that i must tread alone will lead my steps aright
Christ promoted peace by giving us assurance that a line of communication can be established between the Father above and the child below. And who will measure the consolations of the hour of prayer? an immortality who will estimate the peace which a belief in the future life has brought to the sorrowing hearts of the sons of men you may talk to the young about death ending all for life is full and hope is strong but preach not this doctrine to the mother who stands by the deathbed of a babe or to one who is within the shadow of a great affliction when i was a young man i wrote to colonel ingersoll and asked him for his views on god and immortality his secretary answered that the great infidel was not at home but enclosed a copy of a speech of colonel ingersoll's which covered my question i scanned it with eagerness and found that he had expressed himself about as follows i do not say that there is no god i simply say i do not know i do not say that there is no life beyond the grave i simply say i do not know and from that day to this i have asked myself the question and have been unable to answer it to my own satisfaction how could any one find pleasure in taking from a human heart a living faith and substituting therefore the cold and cheerless doctrine i do not know christ gave us proof of immortality and it was a welcome assurance although it would hardly seem necessary that one should rise from the dead to convince us that the grave is not the end to every created thing god has given a tongue that proclaims a future life if the father deigns to touch with divine power the cold and pulseless heart of the buried acorn and to make it burst forth from its prison walls Will he leave neglected in the earth the soul of man made in the image of his creator? If he stoops to give to the rose bush, whose withered blossoms float upon the autumn breeze, the sweet assurance of another springtime? Will he refuse the words of hope to the sons of men when the frosts of winter come? If matter, mute and inanimate, though changed by the forces of nature into a multitude of forms, can never die? will the imperial spirit of man suffer annihilation when it has paid a brief visit like a royal guest to this tenement of clay no i am sure that he who notwithstanding his apparent prodigality created nothing without a purpose and wasted not a single atom in all his creation has made provision for a future life in which man's universal longing for immortality will find its realization i am as sure that we live again as i am sure that we live today in cairo i secured a few grains of wheat that had slumbered for more than thirty centuries in an egyptian tomb as i looked at them this thought came into my mind if one of those grains had been planted on the banks of the nile the year after it grew and all its lineal descendants had been planted and replanted from that time until now its progeny would to-day be sufficiently numerous to feed the teeming millions of the world an unbroken chain of life connects the earliest grains of wheat with the grains that we sow and reap there isn't the grains of wheat an invisible something which has power to discard the body that we see and from earth and air fashion a new body so much like the old one that we cannot tell the one from the other if this invisible germ of life in the grain of wheat can thus pass unimpaired through three thousand resurrections i shall not doubt that my soul has power to clothe itself with a body suited to its new existence when this earthly frame has crumbled into dust A belief in immortality not only consoles the individual, but it exerts a powerful influence in bringing peace between individuals. If one actually thinks that man dies as the brute dies, he will yield more easily to the temptation to do injustice to his neighbor when the circumstances are such as to promise security from detection but if one really expects to meet again and live eternally with those whom he knows to-day 
he is restrained from evil deeds by the fear of endless remorse we do not know what rewards are in store for us or what punishments may be reserved but if there were no other it would be some punishment for one who deliberately and consciously wrongs another to have to live forever in the company of the person wronged and have his littleness and selfishness laid bare i repeat a belief in immortality must exert a powerful influence in establishing justice between men and thus laying the foundation for peace again christ deserves to be called the prince of peace because he has given us a message of greatness which promotes peace when his disciples quarreled among themselves as to which should be greatest in the kingdom of heaven he rebuked them and said let him who would be chiefest among you be the servant of all service is the measure of greatness it always has been true it is true today and it always will be true that he is greatest who does the most of good and how this old world will be transformed when this standard of greatness becomes the standard of every life Nearly all of our controversies and combats grow out of the fact that we're trying to get something from each other. There will be peace when our aim is to do something for each other. Our enmities and animosities arise largely from our efforts to get as much as possible out of the world. There will be peace when our endeavor is to put as much as possible into the world. The human measure of a human life is its income the divine measure of a life is its outgo its overflow its contribution to the welfare of all christ also led the way to peace by giving us a formula for the propagation of truth not all of those who have really desired to do good have employed the christian method not all christians even in the history of the human race but two methods have been used the first is the forcible method and it has been employed most frequently a man has an idea which he thinks is good he tells his neighbors about it and they do not like it this makes him angry he thinks it would be so much better for them if they would like it and seizing a club he attempts to make them like it but one trouble about this rule is that it works both ways when a man starts out to compel his neighbors to think as he does he generally finds them willing to accept the challenge and they spend so much time in trying to coerce each other that they have no time left to do each other good the other is the bible plan be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good and there is no other way of overcoming evil i am not much of a farmer i get more credit for my farming than i deserve and my little farm receives more advertising than it is entitled to but i am farmer enough to know that if i cut down weeds they will spring up again and farmer enough to know that if i plant something there which has more vitality than the weeds i shall not only get rid of the constant cutting but have the benefit of the crop besides in order that there might be no mistake in his plan of propagating the truth christ went into detail and laid emphasis upon the value of example so live that others seeing your good works may be constrained to glorify your father which is in heaven there is no human influence so potent for good as that which goes out from an upright life a sermon may be answered the arguments presented in the speech may be disputed but no one can answer a christian life it is the unanswerable argument in favor of our religion it may be a slow process this conversion of the world by the silent influence of a noble example but it is the only sure one and the doctrine applies to nations as well as to individuals the gospel of the prince of peace gives us the only hope that the world has and it is an increasing hope of the substitution of reason for the arbitrament of force in the settlement of international disputes and our nation ought not to wait for other nations it ought to take the lead and prove its faith in the omnipotence of truth 
but christ has given us a platform so fundamental that it can be applied successfully to all controversies we are interested in platforms we attend conventions sometimes traveling long distances we have wordy wars over the phraseology of various planks and then we wage earnest campaigns to secure the endorsement of these platforms at the poles the platform given to the world by the prince of peace is more far-reaching and more comprehensive than any platform ever written by the convention of any party in any country when he condensed into one commandment those of the ten which relate to man's duty toward his fellows and enjoined upon us the rule thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself he presented a plan for the solution of all the problems that now vex society or may hereafter arise other remedies may palliate or postpone the day of settlement but this is all sufficient and the reconciliation which it effects is a permanent one my faith in the future and i have faith and my optimism for i am an optimist my faith and my optimism rest upon the belief that christ's teachings are being more studied today than ever before and that with this larger study will come a larger application of those teachings to the everyday life of the world and to the questions with which we deal in former times when men read that christ came to bring life and immortality to light they place the emphasis upon immortality now they are studying christ's relation to human life people used to read the bible to find out what it said of heaven now they read it more to find out what light it throws upon the pathway of today in former years many thought to prepare themselves for future bliss by a life of seclusion here we are learning that to follow in the footsteps of the master we must go about doing good christ declared that he came that we might have life and have it more abundantly the world is learning that christ came not to narrow life but to enlarge it not to rub it of its joy but to fill it to overflowing with purpose earnestness and happiness but this prince of peace promises not only peace but strength some have thought his teachings fit only for the weak and the timid and unsuited to men of vigor energy and ambition nothing could be farther from the truth only the man of faith can be courageous confident that he fights on the side of jehovah he doubts not the success of his cause what matters it whether he shares in the shouts of triumph if every word spoken in behalf of truth has its influence and every deed done for the right weighs in the final account it is immaterial to the christian whether his eyes behold victory or whether he dies in the midst of the conflict yea though thou lie upon the dust when they who help thee flee in fear die full of hope and manly trust like those who fell in battle here another hand thy sword shall wield another hand the standard wave till from the trumpet's mouth is pealed the blast of triumph o'er thy grave only those who believe attempt the seemingly impossible and by attempting prove that one with god can chase a thousand and that two can put ten thousand to flight i can imagine that the early christians who were carried into the Colosseum to make a spectacle for those more savage than the beasts were entreated by their doubting companions not to endanger their lives but kneeling in the center of the arena they prayed and sang until they were devoured how helpless they seemed and measured by every human rule how hopeless was their cause and yet within a few decades the power which they invoked proved mightier than the legions of the emperor and the faith in which they died was triumphant o'er all the land it is said that those who went to mock at their sufferings returned asking themselves 
What is it that can enter into the heart of man and make him die as these die? They were greater conquerors in their death than they could have been had they purchased life by a surrender of their faith. What would have been the fate of the church if the early Christians had had as little faith as many of our Christians of today? And if the Christians of today had the faith of the martyrs, how long would it be before the fulfillment of the prophecy that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess? I am glad that he who is called the Prince of Peace, who can bring peace to every troubled heart, and whose teachings, exemplified in life, will bring peace between man and man, between community and community, between state and state, between nation and nation throughout the world. I am glad that he brings courage as well as peace so that those who follow him may take up and each day bravely do the duties that to that day fall as the christian grows older he appreciates more and more the completeness with which christ satisfies the longings of the heart and grateful for the peace which he enjoys and the strength which he has received he repeats the words of the great scholar sir william jones before thy mystic altar heavenly truth i kneel in manhood as i knelt in youth thus let me kneel till this dull form decay and life's last shade be brightened by thy ray end of section 45 recording by paul adams www.yawnguy.com Section 46 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings from the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adams. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Asenwein. Section 46, Appendix D, Speeches for Study and Practice. Rufus Coat, Eulogy of Webster, delivered at Dartmouth College, July 27, 1853. Webster possessed the element of an impressive character, inspiring regard, trust, and admiration, not unmingled with love. It had, I think, intrinsically a charm such as belongs only to a good, noble, and beautiful nature. In its combination with so much fame, so much force of will, and so much intellect, it filled and fascinated the imagination and heart. It was affectionate in childhood and youth, and it was more than ever so in the few last months of his long life. It is the universal testimony that he gave to his parents in largest measure honor, love, obedience that he eagerly appropriated the first means which he could command to relieve the father from the debts contracted to educate his brother and himself, that he selected his first place of professional practice, that he might soothe the coming on of his old age. Equally beautiful was his love of all his kindred and of all his friends. When I hear him accused of selfishness and a cold, bad nature, I recall him lying sleepless all night, not without tears of boyhood, conferring with Ezekiel how the darling desire of both hearts should be compassed, and he too admitted to the precious privileges of education, courageously pleading the cause of both brothers in the morning, prevailing by the wise and discerning affection of the mother, suspending his studies of the law, and registering deeds and teaching school to earn the means, for both, of availing themselves of the opportunity which the parental self-sacrifice had placed within their reach. Loving him through life, mourning him when dead, with a love and a sorrow very wonderful, passing the sorrow of woman, I recall the husband, the father of the living and of the early departed, the friend, the counsellor of many years, 
and my heart grows too full and liquid for the refutation of words. His affectionate nature, craving ever friendship, as well as the presence of kindred blood, diffused itself through all of his private life, gave sincerity to all his hospitalities, kindness to his eye, warmth to the pressure of his hand, made his greatness and genius unbend themselves to the playfulness of childhood, flowed out in graceful memories indulged of the past or the dead, of incidents when life was young and promised to be happy, gave generous sketches of his rivals, the high contention now hidden by the handful of earth. Hours passed fifty years ago with great authors, recalled for the vernal emotions which then they made to live and revel in the soul. And from these conversations of friendship, no man, no man, old or young, went away to remember one word of profaneness, one illusion of indelicacy, one impure thought, one unbelieving suggestion, one doubt cast on the reality of virtue, of patriotism, of enthusiasm, of the progress of man, one doubt cast on righteousness, or temperance, or judgment to come. I have learned by evidence the most direct and satisfactory that in the last months of his life the whole affectionateness of his nature, his consideration of others, his gentleness, his desire to make them happy and to see them happy, seemed to come out in more and more beautiful and habitual expressions than ever before. The long day's public tasks were felt to be done. The cares, the uncertainties, the mental conflicts of high place were ended. And he came home to recover himself for the few years which he might still expect would be his before he should go hence to be here no more. And there, I am assured and duly believe, no unbecoming regrets pursued him no discontent as for injustice suffered or expectations unfulfilled no self-reproach for anything done or anything omitted by himself no irritation no peevishness unworthy of his noble nature but instead love and hope for his country when she became the subject of conversation and for all around him the dearest and most indifferent for all breathing things about him the overflow of the kindest heart growing in gentleness and benevolence paternal patriarchal affections seeming to become more natural warm and communicative every hour Softer and yet brighter grew the tints on the sky of parting day, and the last lingering rays, more even than the glories of noon, announced how divine was the source from which they proceeded, how incapable to be quenched, how certain to rise on a morning which no night should follow. Such a character was made to be loved. It was loved. Those who knew and saw it in its hour of calm, those who could repose on that soft green, loved him. His plain neighbors loved him, and one said, when he was laid in his grave, how lonesome the world seems. Educated young men loved him the ministers of the gospel the general intelligence of the country the masses afar off loved him true they had not found in his speeches read by millions so much adulation of the people so much of the music which robs the public reason of itself so many phrases of humanity and philanthropy and some had told them he was lofty and cold solitary in his greatness but every year they came nearer and nearer to him and as they came nearer they loved him better they heard how tender the son had been the husband the brother the father the friend and neighbor that he was plain simple natural generous hospitable the heart larger than the brain that he loved little children and reverenced god the scriptures the sabbath day the constitution and the law and their hearts clave unto him
more truly of him than even of the great naval darling of england might it be said that his presence would set the church bells ringing and give schoolboys a holiday would bring children from school and old men from the chimney corner to gaze on him ere he died the great and unavailing lamentations first revealed the deep place he had in the hearts of his countrymen. You are now to add to this his extraordinary power of influencing the convictions of others by speech, and you have completed the survey of the means of his greatness. And here, again, I begin by admiring an aggregate made up of excellences and triumphs, ordinarily deemed incompatible. He spoke with consummate ability to the bench, and yet exactly, as, according to every sound canon of taste and ethics, the bench ought to be addressed. He spoke with consummate ability to the jury, and yet, exactly as, according to every sound canon, that totally different tribunal ought to be addressed. In the halls of Congress, before the people assembled for political discussions in masses, before audiences smaller and more select, assembled for some solemn commemoration of the past or of the dead, in each of these again his speech of the first form of ability was exactly adapted also to the critical properties of the place each achieved when delivered the most instant and specific success of eloquence some of them in a splendid and remarkable degree and yet stranger still when reduced to writing as they fell from his lips they compose a body of reading in many volumes solid clear rich and full of harmony a classical and permanent political literature and yet all of these modes of his eloquence, exactly adapted each to its stage and its end, were stamped with his image and superscription. Identified by characteristics incapable to be counterfeited and impossible to be mistaken. The same high power of reason, intent in every one to explore and display some truth some truth of judicial or historical or biographical fact some truth of law deduced by construction perhaps or by elation some truth of policy for want whereof a nation generations may be the worse reason seeking and unfolding truth the same tone in all of deep earnestness expressive of strong desire that what he felt to be important should be accepted as true and spring up to action the same transparent plain forcible and direct speech conveying his exact thought to the mind not something less or more the same sovereignty of form of brow and eye and tone and manner everywhere the intellectual king of men standing before you that same marvelousness of qualities and results residing i know not where in words in pictures in the ordering of ideas in felicities indescribable by means whereof coming from his tongue all things seemed mended truth seemed more true probability more plausible greatness more grand goodness more awful every affection more tender than when coming from other tongues these are in all his eloquence but sometimes it became individualized and discriminated even from itself sometimes place and circumstances great interests at stake a stage an audience fitted for the highest historic action a crisis personal or national upon him stirred the depths of that emotional nature as the anger of the goddess stirs the sea on which the great epic is beginning 
strong passions themselves kindled to intensity quickened every faculty to a new life the stimulated associations of ideas brought all treasures of thought and knowledge within command the spell which often held his imagination fast dissolved and she arose and gave him to choose of her urn of gold earnestness became vehement the simple perspicuous measured and direct language became a headlong full and burning tide of speech the discourse of reason wisdom gravity and beauty changed to that superhuman that rarest consummate eloquence grand rapid pathetic terrible the aliquid immensum infinumque that cicero might have recognized the master triumph of man in the rarest opportunity of his noble power Ah! such elevation above himself in congressional debate was most uncommon some such there were in the great discussions of executive power following the removal of the deposits which they who heard them will never forget and some which rest in the tradition of hearers only but there were other fields of oratory on which under the influence of more uncommon springs of inspiration he exemplified in still other forms an eloquence of which i do not know that he has had a superior among men addressing masses by tens of thousands in the open air on the urgent political questions of the day or designed to lead the meditations of an hour devoted to the remembrance of some national era or of some incident marking the progress of the nation and lifting him up to a view of what is and what is past and some indistinct revelation of the glory that lies in the future or of some great historical name just borne by the nation to his tomb we have learned that then and there at the base of bunker hill before the cornerstone was laid and again when from the finished column the centuries looked on him in fanal hall mourning for those with whose spoken or written eloquence of freedom its arches had so often resounded on the rock of plymouth before the capital of which there shall not be one stone left on another before his memory shall have ceased to live in such scenes unfettered by the laws of forensic or parliamentary debate multitudes uncounted lifting up their eyes to him some great historical scenes of america around all symbols of her glory and art and power and fortune there voices of the past not unheard shapes beckoning from the future not unseen sometimes that mighty intellect borne upward to a height and kindled to an illumination which we shall see no more wrought out as it were in an instant a picture of vision warning prediction the progress of the nation the contrasts of it eras the heroic deaths the motives to patriotism the maxims and arts imperial by which the glory has been gathered and may be heightened wrought out in an instant a picture to fade only when all record of our mind shall die in looking over the public remains of his oratory it is striking to remark how even in that most sober and massive understanding and nature you see gathered and expressed the characteristic sentiments and the passing time of our america it is the strong old oak which ascends before you let our soil our heaven are attested in it as perfectly as if it were a flower that could grow in no other climate and in no other hour of the year or day let me instance in one thing only it is a peculiarity of some scores of eloquence that they embody and utter not merely the individual genius and character of the speaker but a national consciousness a national era a mood a hope a dread a despair in which you listen to the spoken history of the time
There is an eloquence of an expiring nation, such as seems to sadden the glorious speech of Demosthenes, such as breathes grand and gloomy from visions of the prophets of the last days of Israel and Judah, such as gave a spell to the expression of Grattan and of Kasuth, the sweetest, most mournful, most awful of the words which man may utter or which man may hear the eloquence of a perishing nation. There is another eloquence in which the national consciousness of a young or renewed and vast strength of trust in a dazzling certain and limitless future, an inward glorying in victories yet to be won, sounds out as by voice of clarion, challenging to contest for the highest prize of earth such as that in which the leader of Israel in its first days holds up to the new nation the land of promise, such as that which, in the well-imagined speeches scattered by Livy over the history of the majestic series of victories, speaks the Roman consciousness of growing aggrandizement which should subject the world such as that through which at the tribunes of her revolution in the bulletins of her rising soldiers france told to the world her dream of glory and of this kind somewhere is ours cheerful hopeful trusting as befits youth and spring the eloquence of a state beginning to ascend to the first class of power eminence and consideration and conscious of itself it is to no purpose that they tell you it is in bad taste that it partakes of arrogance and vanity that a true national good breeding would not know or seem to know whether the nation is old or young whether the tides of being are in their flow or ebb whether these courses of the sun are sinking slowly to rest wearied with a journey of a thousand years or just bounding from the orient unbreathed Higher laws than those of taste determine the consciousness of nations. Higher laws than those of taste determine the general forms of the expression of that consciousness. Let the downward age of America find its orators and poets and artists to erect its spirit or grace and soothe its dying. Be it ours to go up with Webster to the rock, the monument, the capital, and bid the distant generations hail. Until the seventh day of March, 1850, I think it would have been accorded to him by an almost universal acclaim, as general and as expressive of profound and intelligent conviction, and of enthusiasm, love, and trust, as ever saluted conspicuous statesmanship, tried by many crises of affairs in a great nation, agitated ever by parties, and wholly Free. End of section 46, recording by Paul Adams, www.yawnguy.com. Section 47 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adams. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Asenwein. Section 47, Appendix D, Speeches for Study and Practice. Albert J. Beveridge, Past Prosperity Around. Delivered as Temporary Chairman of the Progressive Party, National Convention, Chicago, Illinois, June 1911. We stand for a nobler America. We stand for an undivided nation. We stand for a broader liberty, a fuller justice. We stand for a social brotherhood as against savage individualism. We stand for an intelligent cooperation instead of a reckless competition. We stand for mutual helpfulness instead of mutual hatred. 
we stand for equal rights as a fact of life instead of a catchword of politics we stand for the rule of the people as a practical truth instead of a meaningless pretense we stand for a representative government that represents the people we battle for the actual rights of man to carry out our principles we have a plain program of constructive reform we mean to tear down only that which is wrong and out of date and where we tear down we mean to build what is right and fitted to the times we hearken to the call of the present we mean to make laws fit conditions as they are and meet the needs of the people who are on earth today that we may do this we found a party through which all who believe with us can work with us or rather we declare our allegiance to the party which the people themselves have founded for this party comes from the grass roots it has grown from the soil of the people's hard necessities it has the vitality of the people's strong convictions the people have work to be done and our party is here to do that work abuse will only strengthen it ridicule only hasten its growth falsehood only speed its victory for years this party has been forming parties exist for the people not the people for parties yet for years the politicians have made the people do the work of the parties instead of the parties doing the work of the people and the politicians own the parties the people vote for one party and find their hopes turn to ashes on their lips and then to punish that party they vote for the other party so it is that partisan victories have come to be merely the people's vengeance and always the secret powers have played their game like other free people most of us americans are progressive or reactionary liberal or conservative the neutrals do not count yet today neither of the old parties is either wholly progressive or wholly reactionary democratic politicians and office seekers say to reactionary democratic voters that the democratic party is reactionary enough to express reactionary views and they say to progressive democrats that the democratic party is progressive enough to express progressive views at the same time republican politicians and office seekers say the same thing about the republican party to progressive and reactionary republican voters sometimes in both democratic and republican states the progressives get control of the party locally and then the reactionaries recapture the same party in the same state or this process is reversed so there is no nationwide unity of principle in either party no stability of purpose no clear-cut and sincere program of one party at frank and open war with an equally clear-cut and sincere program of an opposing party this unintelligent tangle is seen in congress republican and democratic senators and representatives believing alike on broad measures affecting the whole republic find it hard to vote together because of the nominal difference of their party membership when sometimes under resistless conviction they do vote together we have this foolish spectacle legislators calling themselves republicans and democrats support the same policy the democratic legislators declaring that that policy is democratic and republican legislators declaring that it is republican and at the very same time other democratic and republican legislators oppose that very same policy each of them declaring that it is not democratic or not republican the condition makes it impossible most of the time and hard at any time for the people's legislators who believe in the same broad policies to enact them into logical comprehensive laws it confuses the public mind it breeds suspicion and distrust it enables such special interests as seek unjust gain at the public expense to get what they want 
It creates and fosters the degrading boss system in American politics through which these special interests work. This boss system is unknown and impossible under any other free government in the world. In its very nature, it is hostile to general welfare. Yet it has grown until it now is a controlling influence in American public affairs. At the present moment, notorious bosses are in the saddle of both old parties in various important states which must be carried to elect a president. This black horse cavalry is the most important force in the practical work of the Democratic and Republican parties in the present campaign. Neither of the old party's nominees for president can escape obligation to these old party bosses or shake their practical hold on many and powerful members of the national legislature. Under this boss system, no matter which party wins, the people seldom win, but the bosses almost always win, and they never work for the people. They do not even work for the party to which they belong. They work only for those anti-public interests whose political employees they are. It is these interests that are the real victors in the end. These special interests which suck the people's substance are bipartisan. They use both parties. They are the invisible government behind our visible government. Democratic and Republican bosses alike are brother officers of this hidden power. No matter how fiercely they pretend to fight one another before election, they work together after election. And, acting so, this political conspiracy is able to delay, mutilate, or defeat sound and needed laws for the people's welfare and the prosperity of honest business, and even to enact bad laws hurtful to the people's welfare and oppressive to honest business. It is this invisible government which is the real danger to American institutions. Its crude work at Chicago in June, which the people were able to see, was no more wicked than its skillful work everywhere, and always which the people are not able to see. But an even more serious condition results from the unnatural alignment of the old parties. Today, we Americans are politically shattered by sectionalism. Through the two old parties, the tragedy of our history is continued, and one great geographical part of the Republic is separated from other parts of the Republic by an illogical partisan solidarity. The South has men and women as genuinely progressive and others as genuinely reactionary as those in other parts of our country. Yet, for well-known reasons, these sincere and honest Southern progressives and reactionaries vote together in a single party, which is neither progressive nor reactionary. They vote a dead tradition and a local fear, not a living conviction and a national faith. They vote not for the Democratic Party, but against the Republican Party. They want to be free from this condition. They can be free from it through the National Progressive Party. For the problems which America faces today are economic and national. They have to do with a more just distribution of prosperity. They concern the living of the people, and therefore the more direct government of the people by themselves. They affect the South exactly as they affect the North, the East, or the West. It is an artificial and dangerous condition that prevents the Southern man and woman from acting with the Northern man and woman who believe the same thing. Yet just that is what the old parties do prevent. Not only does this out-of-date partisanship cut our nation into two geographical sections, it also robs the nation of a priceless asset of thought in working out our national destiny. 
the south once was famous for brilliant and constructive thinking on national problems and today the south has minds as brilliant and constructive as of old but southern intellect cannot freely and fully aid in terms of politics the solving of the nation's problems this is so because of a partisan sectionalism which has nothing to do with those problems yet these problems can be solved only in terms of politics the root of the wrongs which hurt the people is the fact that the people's government has been taken away from them the invisible government has usurped the people's government their government must be given back to the people and so the first purpose of the progressive party is to make sure the rule of the people the rule of the people means that the people themselves shall nominate as well as elect all candidates for office including senators and presidents of the united states what profiteth it the people if they do only the electing while the invisible government does the nominating the rule of the people means that when the people's legislators make a law which hurts the people the people themselves may reject it the rule of the people means that when the people's legislators refuse to pass a law which the people need the people themselves may pass it the rule of the people means that when the people's employees do not do the people's work well and honestly the people may discharge them exactly as a businessman discharges employees who do not do their work well and honestly the people's officials are the people's servants not the people's masters we progressives believe in this rule of the people that the people themselves may deal with their own destiny who knows the people's needs so well as the people themselves who's so patient as the people who's so long-suffering who's so just who's so wise to solve their own problems today these problems concern the living of the people yet in the present stage of american development these problems should not exist in this country for in all the world there is no land so rich as ours our fields can feed hundreds of millions we have more minerals than the whole of europe invention has made easy the turning of this vast natural wealth into supplies for all the needs of man one worker today can produce more than twenty workers could produce a century ago the people living in this land of gold are the most daring and resourceful on the globe coming from the hardiest stock of every nation of the old world their very history in the new world has made americans a peculiar people in courage initiative love of justice and all the elements of independent character and compared with other people we are very few in numbers there are only ninety millions of us scattered over a continent germany has sixty-five millions packed in a country very much smaller than texas the population of great britain and ireland could be set down in california and still have more than enough room for the population of holland if this country were as thickly peopled as belgium there would be more than twelve hundred million instead of only ninety million persons within our borders so we have more than enough to supply every human being beneath the flag there ought not to be in this republic a single day of bad business a single unemployed working man a single unfed child american business men should never know an hour of uncertainty discouragement or fear american working men never a day of low wages idleness or want hunger should never walk in these thinly peopled gardens of plenty and yet in spite of all these favors which providence has showered upon us the living of people is the problem of the hour hundreds of thousands of hard-working americans find it difficult to get enough to live on the average income of an american laborer is less than five hundred dollars a year with this he must furnish food shelter and clothing for a family 
women whose nourishing and protection should be the first care of the state not only are driven into the mighty army of wage earners but are forced to work under unfair and degrading conditions the right of a child to grow into a normal human being is sacred and yet while small and poor countries packed with people have abolished child labor american mills mines factories and sweatshops are destroying hundreds of thousands of american children in body mind and soul at the same time men have grasped fortunes in this country so great that the human mind cannot comprehend their magnitude these mountains of wealth are far larger than even that lavish reward which no one would deny to business risk or genius on the other hand american business is uncertain and unsteady compared with the business of other nations american business men are the best and bravest in the world and yet our business conditions hamper their energies and chill their courage we have no permanency in business affairs no sure outlook upon the business future this unsettled state of american business prevents it from realizing for the people that great and continuous prosperity which our country's location vast wealth and small population justifies we mean to remedy these conditions we mean not only to make prosperity steady but to give to the many who earn it a just share of that prosperity instead of helping the few who do not earn it to take an unjust share the progressive motto is pass prosperity around to make human living easier, to free the hands of honest business, to make trade and commerce sound and steady, to protect womanhood, save childhood, and restore the dignity of manhood, these are the tasks we must do. What, then, is the progressive answer to these questions? We are able to give it specifically and concretely. The first work before us is the revival of honest business. The business is nothing but the industrial and trade activities of all the people. Men grow the products of the field, cut ripe timber from the forest, dig metal from the mine, fashion all for human use, carry them to the marketplace and exchange them according to their mutual needs, and this is business. With our vast advantages, contrasted with the vast disadvantages of other nations, American business all the time should be the best and steadiest in the world. But it is not. Germany, with shallow soil, no mines, only a window on the seas, and a population more than ten times as dense as ours, yet has a sounder business a steadier prosperity a more contented because better cared for people what then must we do to make american business better we must do what poorer nations have done we must end the abuses of business by striking down those abuses instead of striking down business itself we must try to make little business big and all business honest instead of striving to make big business little and yet letting it remain dishonest present-day business is as unlike old-time business as the old-time ox cart is unlike the present-day locomotive invention has made the whole world over again the railroad telegraph telephone have bound the people of modern nations into families to do the business of these closely knit millions in every modern country great business concerns came into being what we call big business is the child of the economic progress of mankind so warfare to destroy big business is foolish because it cannot succeed and wicked because it ought not to succeed warfare to destroy big business does not hurt big business which always comes out on top so much as it hurts all other business which in such a warfare never comes out on top with the growth of big business came business evils just as great 
it is these evils of big business that hurt the people and injure all other business one of these wrongs is overcapitalization, which taxes the people's very living another is the manipulation of prices to the unsettlement of all normal business and to the people's damage another is interference in the making of the people's laws and the running of the people's government in the unjust interest of evil business getting laws that enable particular interests to rob the people and even to gather criminal riches from human health and life is still another an example of such laws is the infamous tobacco legislation of 1902 which authorized the tobacco trust to continue to collect from the people the spanish war tax amounting to a score of millions of dollars but to keep that tax instead of turning it over to the government as it had been doing another example is the shameful meat legislation by which the beef trust had the meat it sent abroad inspected by the government so that foreign countries would take its product and yet was permitted to sell diseased meat to our own people it is incredible that laws like these could ever get on the nation's statute books the invisible government put them there and only the universal wrath of an enraged people corrected them when after years the people discovered the outrages it is to get just such laws as these and to prevent the passage of laws to correct them as well as to keep off the statute books general laws which will end the general abuses of big business that these few criminal interests corrupt our politics invest in public officials and keep in power in both parties that type of politician and party managers who debase american politics Behind rotten laws and preventing sound laws stands the corrupt boss. Behind the corrupt boss stands the robber interest. And commanding these powers of pillage stands bloated human greed. It is this conspiracy of evil we must overthrow if we would get the honest laws we need. It is this invisible government we must destroy if we would save American institutions other nations have ended the very same business evils from which we suffer by clearly defining business wrongdoing and then making it a criminal offense punishable by imprisonment yet these foreign nations encourage big business itself and foster all honest business but they do not tolerate dishonest business little or big what then shall we americans do Common sense and the experience of the world says that we ought to keep the good big business does for us and stop the wrongs that big business does to us. Yet we have done just the other thing. We have struck at big business itself and have not even aimed to strike at the evils of big business. Nearly 25 years ago, Congress passed a law to govern American business in the present time, which Parliament passed in the reign of King James to govern English business in that time. For a quarter of a century, the courts have tried to make this law work. Yet, during this very time, trusts grew greater in number and power than in the whole history of the world before and their evils flourished unhindered and unchecked these great business concerns grew because natural laws made them grow and artificial law at war with natural law could not stop their growth but their evils grew faster than the trusts themselves because avarice nourished those evils and no law of any kind stopped avarice from nourishing them nor is this the worst under the shifting interpretation of the sherman law uncertainty and fear is chilling the energies of the great body of honest american businessmen as the sherman law now stands no two businessmen can arrange their mutual affairs and be sure that they are not lawbreakers this is the main hindrance to the immediate and permanent revival of american business 
if german or english business men with all their disadvantages compared with our advantages were manacled by our sherman law as it stands they soon would be bankrupt indeed foreign business men declare that if their countries had such a law so administered they could not do business at all even this is not all by the decrees of our courts under the sherman law the two mightiest trusts on earth have actually been licensed in the practical outcome to go on doing every wrong they ever committed under the decrees of the courts the oil and tobacco trusts still can raise prices unjustly and already have done so they still can issue watered stock and surely will do so they still can throttle other businessmen and the united cigar stores company now is doing so they still can corrupt our politics and this moment are indulging in that practice the people are tired of this mock battle with criminal capital they do not want to hurt business but they do want to get something done about the trust question that amounts to something what good does it do any man to read in his morning paper that the courts have dissolved the oil trust and then read in his evening paper that he must thereafter pay a higher price for his oil than ever before what good does it do the laborer who smokes his pipe to be told that the courts have dissolved the tobacco trust and yet find that he must pay the same or a higher price for the same short-weight package of tobacco yet all this is the practical result of the suits against these two greatest trusts in the world such business chaos and legal paradoxes as american business suffers from can be found nowhere else in the world rival nations do not fasten legal ball and chain upon their business no they put wings on its flying feet rival nations do not tell their business men that if they go forward with legitimate enterprise the penitentiary may be their goal no rival nations tell their businessmen that so long as they do honest business their governments will not hinder but will help them but these rival nations do tell their businessmen that if they do any evil that our businessmen do prison bars await them these rival nations do tell their businessmen that if they issue watered stock or cheat the people in any way prison cells will be their homes just this is what all honest american business wants just this is what dishonest american business does not want just this is what the american people propose to have just this the national republic platform of 1908 pledged the people that we would give them and just this important pledge the administration elected on that platform repudiated as it repudiated the more immediate tariff pledge both these reforms so vital to honest american business the progressive party will accomplish neither evil interests nor reckless demagogues can swerve us from our purpose for we are free from both and fear neither we mean to put new business laws on our statute books which will tell american businessmen what they can do and what they cannot do we mean to make our business laws clear instead of foggy to make them plainly state just what things are criminal and what are lawful and we mean that the penalty for things criminal shall be prison sentences that actually punish the real offender instead of money fines that hurt nobody but the people who must pay them in the end and then we mean to send the message forth to hundreds of thousands of brilliant minds and brave hearts engaged in honest business that they are not criminals but honorable men in their work to make good business in this republic sure of victory we even now say Go forward, American businessmen, and know that behind you, supporting you, encouraging you, are the power and approval of the greatest people under the sun. 
Go forward, American businessmen, and feed full the fires beneath American furnaces, and give employment to every American laborer who asks for work. Go forward, American businessmen, and capture the markets of the world for American trade, and know that on the wings of your commerce you carry liberty throughout the world and to every inhabitant thereof. Go forward, American businessmen, and realize that in the time to come it shall be said of you, as it is said of the hand that rounded Peter's dome, he builded better than he knew. The next great business reform we must have to steadily increase American prosperity is to change the method of building our tariffs. The tariff must be taken out of politics and treated as a business question instead of as a political question. Heretofore we have done just the other thing. That is why American business is upset every few years by unnecessary tariff upheavals and is weakened by uncertainty in the periods between. The greatest need of business is certainty, but the only thing certain about our tariff is uncertainty. What then shall we do to make our tariff changes strengthen business instead of weakening business? Rival protective tariff nations have answered that question. Common sense has answered it. Next to our need to make the Sherman law modern, understandable, and just, our greatest fiscal need is a genuine, permanent, non-partisan tariff commission. Five years ago, when the fight for this great business measure was begun in the Senate, the bosses of both parties were against it. So, when the last revision of the tariff was on, and a tariff commission might have been written into the tariff law, the administration would not aid this reform. When two years later the administration supported it weakly, the bipartisan boss system killed it. There has not been and will not be any sincere and honest effort by the old parties to get a tariff commission. There has not been and will not be any sincere and honest purpose by those parties to take the tariff out of politics. For the tariff in politics is the excuse for those sham political battles which give the spoilers their opportunity. The tariff in politics is one of the invisible government's methods of wringing tribute from the people. Through the tariff in politics, the beneficiaries of tariff excesses are cared for, no matter which party is revising. Who has forgotten the tariff scandals that made President Cleveland denounce the Wilson-Gorman bill as a perfidy and a dishonor? Who can ever forget the brazen robberies forced into the Payne-Aldrich bill, which Mr. Taft defended as the best ever made? If everyone else forgets these things, the interests that profited by them never will forget them. The bosses and lobbyists that grew rich by putting them through never will forget them. That is why the invisible government and its agents want to keep the old method of tariff building, for, though such tariff revisions may make lean years for the people, they make fat years for the powers of pillage and their agents. So neither of the old parties can honestly carry out any tariff policies which they pledge the people to carry out. But even if they could, and even if they were sincere, the old party platforms are in error on tariff policy. The democratic platform declares for free trade, but free trade is wrong and ruinous. The republican platform permits extortion, but tariff extortion is robbery by law. The progressive party is for honest protection, and honest protection is right and a condition of American prosperity. A tariff high enough to give American producers the American market when they make honest goods and sell them at honest prices, but low enough that when they sell dishonest goods at dishonest prices, foreign competition can correct both evils. A tariff high enough to enable American producers to pay our working men American wages and so arrange that the working men will get such wages. 
a business tariff whose changes will be so made as to reassure business instead of disturbing it this is the tariff and the method of its making in which the progressive party believes for which it does battle and which it proposes to write into the laws of the land the payne aldrich tariff law must be revised immediately in accordance to these principles at the same time a genuine permanent non-partisan tariff commission must be fixed in the law as firmly as the interstate commerce commission neither of the old parties can do this work for neither of the old parties believe in such a tariff and what is more serious special privilege is too thoroughly woven into the fiber of both old parties to allow them to make such a tariff the progressive party only is free from these influences the progressive party only believes in the sincere enactment of a sound tariff policy the progressive party only can change the tariff as it must be changed these are samples of the reforms in the laws of business that we intend to put on the nation's statute books but there are other questions as important and pressing that we mean to answer by sound and humane laws child labor in factories mills mines and sweatshops must be ended throughout the republic such labor is a crime against childhood because it prevents the growth of normal manhood and womanhood it is a crime against the nation because it prevents the growth of a host of children into strong patriotic and intelligent citizens only the nation can stop this industrial vice the states cannot stop it the states never stopped any national wrong and child labor is a national wrong to leave it to the states alone is unjust to business for if some states stop it and other states do not business men of the former are at a disadvantage with the business men of the latter because they must sell in the same market goods made by manhood labor at manhood wages in competition with goods made by childhood labor at childhood wages to leave it to the states is unjust to manhood labor for childhood labor in any state lowers manhood labor in every state because the product of childhood labor in any state competes with the product of manhood labor in every state children workers at the looms in south carolina means bayonets at the breasts of men and women workers in massachusetts who strike the living wages let the states do what they can and more power to their arm but let the nation do what it should and cleanse our flag from this stain modern industrialism has changed the status of women women now are wage earners in factories stores and other places of toil in hours of labor and all the physical conditions of industrial effort they must compete with men and they must do it at lower wages than men receive wages which in most cases are not enough for these women workers to live on this is inhuman and indecent it is unsocial and uneconomic it is immoral and unpatriotic toward women the progressive party proclaims the chivalry of the state we propose to protect women wage earners by suitable laws an example of which is the minimum wage for women workers a wage which shall be high enough to at least buy clothing food and shelter for the woman toiler the care of the aged is one of the most perplexing problems of modern life. How is the working man with less than $500 a year and with earning power waning as his own years advance to provide for aged parents or other relatives in addition to furnishing food, shelter and clothing for his wife and children? what is to become of the family of the laboring man whose strength has been sapped by excessive toil and who has been thrown upon the industrial scrap heap it is questions like these we must answer if we are to justify free institutions they are questions to which the masses of people are chained as to a body of death and they are questions which other and poorer nations are answering 
we progressives mean that america shall answer them the progressive party is the helping hand to those who a vicious industrialism has maimed and crippled we are for the conservation of our natural resources but even more we are for the conservation of human life our forests water power and minerals are valuable and must be saved from the spoilers but men women and children are more valuable and they too must be saved from the spoilers because women as much as men are a part of our economic and social life women as much as men should have the voting power to solve all economic and social problems votes for women are theirs as a matter of natural right alone votes for women should be theirs as a matter of political wisdom also as wage earners they should help to solve the labor problems as property owners they should help to solve the tax problem as wives and mothers they should help to solve all the problems that concern the home and that means all national problems for the nation abides at the fireside if it is said that women cannot help defend the nation in time of war and therefore that they should not help to determine the nation's destinies in time of peace the answer is that women suffer and serve in time of conflict as much as men who carry muskets and the deeper answer is that those who bear the nation's soldiers are as much the nation's defenders as their sons public spokesmen for the invisible government say that many of our reforms are unconstitutional the same kind of men said the same thing of every effort the nation has made to end national abuses but in every case whether in the courts at the ballot box or on the battlefield the vitality of the constitution was vindicated the progressive party believes that the constitution is a living thing growing with the people's growth strengthening with the people's strength aiding the people in their struggle for life liberty and the pursuit of happiness permitting the people to meet all their needs as conditions change the opposition believes that the constitution is a dead form holding back the people's growth shackling the people's strength but giving a free hand to malign powers that prey upon the people the first words of the constitution are we the people and they declare that the constitution's purpose is to form a perfect union and to promote the general welfare to do just that is the very heart of the progressive cause the progressive party asserts anew the vitality of the constitution we believe in the true doctrine of states rights which forbids the nation from interfering with states affairs and also forbids the states from interfering with national affairs the combined intelligence and composite conscience of the american people is as irresistible as it is righteous and the constitution does not prevent that force from working out the general welfare from certain sources we hear preachments about the danger of our reforms to american institutions what is the purpose of american institutions why was this republic established what does the flag stand for what do these things mean they mean that the people shall be free to correct human abuses they mean that men women and children shall not be denied the opportunity to grow stronger and nobler they mean that the people shall have the power to make our land each day a better place to live in they mean the realities of liberty and not the academics of theory they mean the actual progress of the race in tangible items of daily living and not the theoretics of barren disputation if they do not mean these things they are as sounding brass and tinkling cymbals 
a nation of strong, upright men and women, a nation of wholesome homes, realizing the best ideals, a nation whose power is glorified by its justice and whose justice is the conscience of scores of millions of God-fearing people. That is the nation the people need and want, and that is the nation they shall have. For never doubt that we Americans will make good the real meaning of our institutions. Never doubt that we will solve in righteousness and wisdom every vexing problem. Never doubt that in the end the hand from above that leads us upward will prevail over the hand from below that drags us downward. Never doubt that we are indeed a nation whose God is the Lord. And so, never doubt that a braver, fairer, cleaner America surely will come, that a better and brighter life for all beneath the flag surely will be achieved. Those who now scoff soon will pray. Those who now doubt soon will believe. Soon the night will pass, and when, to the sentinel on the ramparts of liberty, the anxious ask, Watchman, what of the night? His answer will be, Lo, the morn appeareth. Knowing the price we must pay, the sacrifice we must make, the burdens we must carry, the assaults we must endure, knowing full well the cost, yet we enlist and we enlist for the war, for we know the justice of our cause, and we know, too, its certain triumph. Not reluctantly then, but eagerly, not with faint hearts, but strong, do we now advance upon the enemies of the people, for the call that comes to us is the call that came to our fathers. As they responded, so shall we. He hath sounded forth a trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift our souls to answer him. Be jubilant our feet. Our God is marching on. End of section 47. Recording by Paul Adams, www.yawnguy.com. Section 48 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adams. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Asenwein. Section 48, Appendix D, Speeches for Study and Practice. Russell Conwell, Acres of Diamonds. Footnote. Reported by A. Russell Smith and Harry E. Grieger, used by permission. On May 21, 1914, when Dr. Conwell delivered this lecture for the 5,000th time, Mr. John Wanamaker said that if the proceeds had been put out at compound interest, the sum would aggregate eight millions of dollars. Dr. Conway has uniformly devoted his lecturing income to works of benevolence. I am astonished that so many people should care to hear this story over again. Indeed, this lecture has become a study in psychology. It often breaks all rules of oratory, departs from the precepts of rhetoric, and yet remains the most popular of any lecture I have delivered in the forty-four years of my public life. I have sometimes studied for a year upon a lecture, and made careful research, and then presented the lecture just once, never delivered it again. I put too much work on it. But this had no work on it, thrown together perfectly at random, spoken offhand without any special preparation, and it succeeds when the thing we study, work over, adjust to a plan, is an entire failure. The acres of diamonds, which I have mentioned through so many years, are to be found in Philadelphia, and you are to find them. Many have found them, 
and what man has done, man can do. I could not find anything better to illustrate my thought than a story I have told over and over again, and which is now found in books in nearly every library. In 1870 we went down the Tigris River. We hired a guide at Baghdad to show us Persepolis, Nineveh, and Babylon, and the ancient countries of Assyria as far as the Arabian Gulf. He was well acquainted with the land, but he was one of those guides who love to entertain their patrons. He was like a barber that tells you many stories in order to keep your mind off the scratching and the scraping. He told me so many stories that I grew tired of his telling them, and I refused to listen, looked away whenever he commenced. That made the guide quite angry. I remember that towards evening he took his Turkish cap off his head and swung it around in the air. The gesture I did not understand, and I did not dare look at him for fear I should become the victim of another story. But, although I am not a woman, I did look, and the instant I turned my eyes upon that worthy guide he was off again. Said he, I will tell you a story now which I reserve for my particular friends. So then, counting myself a particular friend, I listened, and I have always been glad I did. He said there once lived not far from the river Indus an ancient Persian by the name of al Hafed. He said that al Hafed owned a very large farm with orchards, grain fields, and gardens. He was a contented and wealthy man, contented because he was wealthy, and wealthy because he was contented. One day there visited this old farmer, one of those ancient Buddhist priests, and he sat down by al Hafed's fire and told that old farmer how this world of ours was made. He said that this world was once a mere bank of fog, which is scientifically true, and he said that the Almighty thrust his finger into the bank of fog, and then began slowly to move his finger around, and gradually to increase the speed of his finger, until at last he whirled that bank of fog into a solid ball of fire, and it went rolling through the universe, burning its way through other cosmic banks of fog, until it condensed the moisture without, and fell in floods of rain upon the heated surface, and caused the outer crust. Then the internal flames burst through the cooling crust and threw up the mountains and made the hills of the valley of this wonderful world of ours. If this internal melted mass burst out and copied very quickly, it became granite. That which cooled less quickly became silver, and less quickly gold and after gold diamonds were made. Said the old priest, A diamond is a congealed drop of sunlight. This is a scientific truth also. You all know that a diamond is pure carbon, actually deposited sunlight. And he said another thing I would not forget. He declared that a diamond is the last and highest of God's mineral creations as a woman is the last and highest of God's animal creations. I suppose that is the reason why the two have such a liking for each other. And the old priest told al Hafed that if he had a handful of diamonds, he could purchase a whole country, and with a mine of diamonds he could place his children upon thrones through the influence of their great wealth. Al Hafed heard all about diamonds and how much they were worth, and went to his bed that night a poor man. Not that he had lost anything, but poor because he was discontented, and discontented because he thought he was poor. He said, I want a mine of diamonds. So he lay awake all night, and early in the morning sought out the priest. Now, I know from experience that a priest when awakened early in the morning is cross. He awoke that priest out of his dreams and said to him, Will you tell me where I can find diamonds? The priest said, Diamonds? What do you want with diamonds? I want to be immensely rich, said Al-Hafed, but I don't know where to go. 
Well, said the priest, if you will find a river that runs over white sand between high mountains, in those sands you will always see diamonds. Do you really believe that there is such a river? Plenty of them, plenty of them. All you have to do is just go and find them. Then you have them. al Hafed said, I will go. So he sold his farm, collected his money at interest, left his family in charge of a neighbor, and away he went in search of diamonds. He began very properly, to my mind, at the mountains of the moon. Afterwards he went around into Palestine, then wandered on into Europe, and at last, when his money was all spent, and he was in rags, wretchedness, and poverty, he stood on the shore of that bay in Barcelona, Spain, when a tidal wave came rolling through the pillars of Hercules, and the poor, afflicted, suffering man could not resist the awful temptation to cast himself into that incoming tide, and he sank beneath its foaming crest, never to rise in this life again. When that old guide had told me that very sad story, he stopped the camel I was riding and went back to fix the baggage on one of the other camels, and I remember thinking to myself, why did he reserve that for his particular friends? There seemed to be no beginning, middle, or end, nothing to it. That was the first story I ever heard told or read in which the hero was killed in the first chapter. I had but one chapter of that story, and the hero was dead. When the guide came back and took up the halter of my camel again, he went right on with the same story. He said that al Hafed's successor led his camel out into the garden to drink, and as that camel put its nose down into the clear water of the garden brook, al Hafed's successor noticed a curious flash of light from the sands of the shallow stream, and reaching in he pulled out a black stone having an eye of light that reflected all the colors of the rainbow, and he took that curious pebble into the house, and left it on the mantel, then went on his way and forgot all about it. A few days after that, the same old priest who told al Hafed how diamonds were made came in to visit his successor, when he saw that flash of light from the mantel. He rushed up and said, Here is a diamond, here is a diamond. Has al Hafed returned? No, no, al Hafed has not returned. And that is not a diamond, that is nothing but a stone. We found it right out here in our garden. But I know a diamond when I see it, said he. That is a diamond. Then together they rushed to the garden and stirred up the white sands with their fingers and found others more beautiful, more valuable diamonds than the first. And thus, said the guide to me, were discovered the diamond mines of Golconda, the most magnificent diamond mines in all the history of mankind, exceeding the Kimberley in its value. The great Kohinoor diamond in England's crown jewels, and the largest crown diamond on earth in Russia's crown jewels, which I had often hoped she would have to sell before they had peace with Japan, came from that mine. And when the old guide had called my attention to that wonderful discovery, he took his Turkish cap off his head again and swung it around in the air to call my attention to the moral. Those Arab guides have a moral to each story, though the stories are not always moral. He said, Had al Hafed remained at home and dug in his own cellar or in his own garden, instead of wretchedness, starvation, poverty, and death in a strange land, he would have had acres of diamonds. For every acre, yes, every shovelful of that old farm afterwards revealed the gems which since have decorated the crowns of monarchs. When he had given the moral to his story, I saw why he had reserved this story for his particular friends. I didn't tell him I could see it. I was not going to tell that old Arab that I could see it. 
for it was that mean old Arab's way of going around a thing, like a lawyer, and saying indirectly what he did not dare say directly, that there was a certain young man that day traveling down the Tigris River that might better be at home in America. I didn't tell him I could see it. I told him his story reminded me of one, and I told it to him quick. I told him about that man out in California who, in 1847, owned a ranch out there. He read that gold had been discovered in Southern California, and he sold his ranch to Colonel Sutter and started off to hunt for gold. Colonel Sutter put a mill on the little stream in that farm, and one day his little girl brought some wet sand from the raceway of the mill into the house and placed it before the fire to dry and as that sand was falling through the little girl's fingers a visitor saw the first shining scales of real gold that were ever discovered in california and the man who wanted the gold had sold this ranch and gone away never to return i delivered this lecture two years ago in california in the city that stands near that farm and they told me that the mine is not exhausted yet and that a one-third owner of that farm has been getting during these recent years twenty dollars of gold every fifteen minutes of his life sleeping or waking why you and i would enjoy an income like that but the best illustration that i have now of this thought was found here in pennsylvania there was a man living in pennsylvania who owned a farm here and he did what i should do if i had a farm in pennsylvania he sold it but before he sold it he concluded to secure employment collecting coal oil for his cousin in canada they first discovered coal oil there so this farmer in pennsylvania decided that he would apply for a position with his cousin in canada now you see this farmer was not altogether a foolish man he did not leave his farm until he had something else to do of all the simpletons the stars shine on there is none more foolish than a man who leaves one job before he has obtained another and that has especial reference to gentlemen of my profession and has no reference to a man seeking a divorce so i say this old farmer did not leave one job until he had obtained another he wrote to canada but his cousin replied that he could not engage him because he did not know anything about the oil business well then said he i will understand it so he set himself at the study of the whole subject he began at the second day of the creation he studied the subject from the primitive vegetation to the coal oil stage until he knew all about it then he wrote to his cousin and said now i understand the oil business and his cousin replied to him all right then come on that man, by the record of the county, sold his farm for $833, even money, no cents. He had scarcely gone from that farm before the man who purchased it went out to arrange for the watering of the cattle, and he found that the previous owner had arranged the matter very nicely. There is a stream running down the hillside there, and the previous owner had gone out and put a plank across the stream at an angle, extending across the brook and down edgewise a few inches under the surface of the water. The purpose of the plank across that brook was to throw over to the other bank a dreadful-looking scum, through which the cattle would not put their noses to drink above the plank, although they would drink the water on one side below it thus that man who had gone to canada had been himself damming back for twenty-three years a flow of coal oil which the state geologist of pennsylvania declared officially as early as eighteen seventy was then worth to our state a hundred millions of dollars the city of titusville now stands on that farm and those pleasantville wells flow on and that farmer who had studied all about the formation of oil since the second day of god's creation clear down to the present time sold that farm for eight hundred and thirty three dollars no cents again i say 
no sense. But I need another illustration, and I found that in Massachusetts, and I am sorry I did, because that is my old state. This young man I mention went out of the state to study, went down to Yale College and studied mines and mining. They paid him fifty dollars a week during his last year for training students who were behind their classes in mineralogy, out of hours, of course, while pursuing his own studies. But when he graduated, they raised his pay from $15 to $45 and offered him a professorship. Then he went straight home to his mother and said, Mother, I won't work for $45 a week. What is $45 a week for a man with a brain like mine? Mother, let's go out to California and stake out gold claims and be immensely rich. Now, said his mother, it is just as well to be happy as it is to be rich. But as he was the only son he had his way, they always do and they sold out in massachusetts and went to wisconsin where he went into the employ of the superior copper mining company and he was lost from sight in the employ of that company at fifteen dollars a week again he was also to have an interest in any mines that he should discover for that company but i do not believe that he has ever discovered a mine i do not know anything about it but i do not believe he has I know he had scarcely gone from the old homestead before the farmer who had bought the homestead went out to dig potatoes, and as he was bringing them in in a large basket through the front gateway, the ends of the stone wall came so near together at the gate that the basket hugged very tight. So he set the basket on the ground and pulled, first on one side and then on the other side. Our farms in Massachusetts are mostly stone walls, and the farmers have to be economical with their gateways in order to have some place to put the stones. That basket hugged so tight that there as he was hauling it through, he noticed in the upper stone next the gate a block of native silver, eight inches square. And this professor of mines and mining and mineralogy, who would not work for $45 a week when he sold that homestead in Massachusetts, sat right on that stone to make the bargain. He was brought up there. He had gone back and forth by that piece of silver, rubbed it with his sleeve, and it seemed to say, Come now, 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 here is a hundred thousand dollars. Why not take me? But he would not take it. There was no silver in Newburyport. It was all a way off. Well, I don't know where. He didn't, but somewhere else. And he was a professor of mineralogy. I do not know of anything I would enjoy better than to take the whole time tonight telling of blunders like that I have heard professors make. Yet, I wish I knew what that man is doing out there in Wisconsin. I can imagine him out there as he sits by his fireside and he is saying to his friends, Do you know that man Conwell that lives in Philadelphia? Oh, yeah, I've heard of him. And do you know that man Jones that lives in that city? Yes, I've heard of him. And then he begins to laugh and laugh and says to his friends, They have done the same thing I did precisely. And that spoils the whole joke because you and I have done it. Ninety out of every hundred people here have made that mistake this very day. I say you ought to be rich. You have no right to be poor. To live in Philadelphia and not be rich is a misfortune, and it is doubly a misfortune, because you could have been rich just as well as be poor. Philadelphia furnishes so many opportunities. You ought to be rich. But persons with certain religious prejudice will ask, How can you spend your time advising the rising generation to give their time to getting money, dollars and cents, the commercial spirit? Yet, I must say that you ought to spend time getting rich. You and I know there are some things more valuable than money. Of course we do. Ah, yes by a heart made unspeakably sad by a grave on which the autumn leaves now fall. 
I know there are some things higher and grander and sublimer than money. Well does the man know who has suffered that there are some things sweeter and holier and more sacred than gold. Nevertheless, the man of common sense also knows that there is not any one of those things that is not greatly enhanced by the use of money. Money is power. Love is the grandest thing on God's earth, but fortunate the lover who has plenty of money. Money is power. Money has powers. And for a man to say, I do not want money, is to say, I do not wish to do any good to my fellow men. It is absurd thus to talk. It is absurd to disconnect them. This is a wonderfully great life, and you ought to spend your time getting money because of the power there is in money. And yet this religious prejudice is so great that some people think it is a great honor to be one of God's poor. I am looking in the faces of people who think just that way. I heard a man once say in a prayer meeting that he was thankful that he was one of God's poor. And then I silently wondered what his wife would say to that speech as she took in washing to support the man while he sat and smoked on the veranda. I don't want to see any more of that land of God's poor. Now, when a man could have been rich just as well, and he is now weak because he is poor, he has done some great wrong. He has been untruthful to himself. He has been unkind to his fellow men. We ought to get rich if we can by honorable and Christian methods, and these are the only methods that sweep us quickly toward the goal of riches. I remember, not many years ago, a young theological student who came into my office and said to me that he thought it was his duty to come in and labor with me. I asked him what had happened, and he said, I feel it is my duty to come in and speak to you, sir, and say that the Holy Scriptures declare that money is the root of all evil. I asked him where he found that saying, and he said he found it in the Bible. I asked him whether he had made a new Bible, and he said, no, he had not gotten a new Bible, that it was in the old Bible. Well, I said, if it is in my Bible, I never saw it. Will you please get the textbook and let me see it? He left the room and soon came stalking in with his Bible open, with all the bigoted pride of the narrow sectarian who founds his creed on some misinterpretation of Scripture. And he put the Bible down on the table before me and fairly squealed into my ear, There it is, you can read it for yourself. I said to him, Young man, you will learn, when you get a little older, that you cannot trust another denomination to read the Bible for you. I said, Now, you belong to another denomination. Please read it to me, and remember that you are taught in a school where emphasis is exegesis. So he took the Bible and read it, The love of money is the root of all evil. Then he had it right. The great book has come back into the esteem and love of the people, and into the respect of the greatest minds of earth, and now you can quote it and rest your life and your death on it without more fear. So, when he quoted right from the scriptures, he quoted the truth. The love of money is the root of all evil. Oh, that is it. It is the worship of the means instead of the end, though you cannot reach the end without the means. When a man makes an idol of the money instead of the purposes for which it may be used, when he squeezes the dollar until the eagle squeals, then it is made the root of all evil. Think, if you only had the money, what you could do for your wife, your child, and for your home and your city. Think how soon you could endow the temple college yonder if you only had the money and the disposition to give it. And yet, my friend, people say you and I should not spend the time getting rich. How inconsistent the whole thing is. We ought to be rich because money has power. 
I think the best thing for me to do is to illustrate this. For if I say you ought to get rich, I ought at least to suggest how it is done. We get a prejudice against rich men because of the lies that are told about them. The lies that are told about Mr. Rockefeller because he has two hundred million dollars, so many believe them. Yet how false is the representation of that man to the world? How little we can tell what is true nowadays when newspapers try to sell their papers entirely on some sensation. The way they lie about the rich men is something terrible. And I do not know that there is anything to illustrate this better than what the newspapers now say about the city of Philadelphia. A young man came to me the other day and said, If Mr. Rockefeller, as you think, is a good man, why is it that everybody says so much against him? It is because he has gotten ahead of us. That is the whole of it, just gotten ahead of us. Why is it Mr. Carnegie is criticized so sharply by an envious world? Because he has gotten more than we have. If a man knows more than I know, don't I incline to criticize somewhat his learning? Let a man stand in a pulpit and preach to thousands, and if I have fifteen people in my church and they're all asleep, don't I criticize him? We always do that to the man who gets ahead of us. Why, the man you are criticizing has one hundred millions, and you have fifty cents, and both of you have just what you are worth. One of the richest men in this country came into my home and sat down in my parlor and said, Did you see all those lies about my family in the paper? Certainly I did. I knew they were lies when I saw them. Why do they lie about me the way they do? Well, I said to him, If you give me your check for one hundred millions, I will take all the lies along with it. Well, said he, I don't see any sense in their thus talking about my family and myself. Conwell, tell me frankly, what do you think the American people think of me? Well, said I, they think you are the blackest-hearted villain that ever trod the soil. But what can I do about it? There is nothing he can do about it. And yet he is one of the sweetest Christian men I ever knew. If you get a hundred millions, you will have the lies. You will be lied about, and you can judge your success in any line by the lies that are told about you. I say that you ought to be rich, but there are ever coming to me young men who say, I would like to go into business, but I cannot. Why not? Because I have no capital to begin on. Capital, capital to begin on. What, young man, living in Philadelphia and looking at all this wealthy generation, all of whom began as poor boys, and you want capital to begin on? It is fortunate for you that you have no capital. I am glad you have no money. I pity a rich man's son. A rich man's son in these days of ours occupies a very difficult position. They are to be pitied. A rich man's son cannot know the very best things in human life. He cannot. The statistics of Massachusetts show us that not one out of seventeen rich men's sons ever die rich. They are raised in luxury. They die in poverty. Even if a rich man's son retains his father's money, even then he cannot know the best things of life. A young man in our college yonder asked me to formulate for him what I thought was the happiest hour in a man's history. And I studied it long and came back convinced that the happiest hour that any man ever sees in any earthly matter is when a young man takes his bride over the threshold of the door for the first time of the house he himself has earned and built when he turns to his bride and with an eloquence greater than any language of mine he saith to his wife my loved one I earned this home myself, I earned it all, it is all mine, and I divide it with thee. That is the grandest moment a human heart may ever see. 
but a rich man's son cannot know that he goes into a finer mansion it may be but he is obliged to go through the house and say mother gave me this mother gave me that my mother gave me that my mother gave me that until his wife wishes she had married his mother oh i pity a rich man's son i do until he gets so far along in his dudism that he gets his arms up like that and can't get them down didn't you ever see any of them astray at atlantic city i saw one of these scarecrows once and i never tire thinking about it i was at niagara falls lecturing and after the lecture i went to the hotel and when i went up to the desk there stood a millionaire's son from new york he was an indescribable specimen of anthropologic potency he carried a gold-headed cane under his arm more in its head than he had in his i do not believe i could describe the young man if i should try but still i must say that he wore an eyeglass he could not see through patent leather shoes he could not walk in and pants he could not sit down in dressed like a grasshopper well this human cricket came up to the clerk's desk just as i went in he adjusted his unseeing eyeglass in this wise and lisped to the clerk because it's english you know to lisp sir sir will you have the kindness to furnish me with some paper and some envelopes the clerk measured that man quick and he pulled out a drawer and took some envelopes and paper and cast them across the counter and turned away to his books you should have seen that specimen of humanity when the paper and envelopes came across the counter he whose wants had always been anticipated by servants he adjusted his unseeing eyeglass and he yelled after that clerk come back here sir come right back here now sir will you order a servant to take that paper and those envelopes and carry them to yonder desk oh that poor miserable contemptible american monkey he couldn't carry paper and envelopes twenty feet i suppose he could not get his arms down i have no pity for such travesties of human nature if you have no capital i'm glad of it you don't need capital you need common sense not copper cents a t stewart the great princely merchant of new york the richest man in america in his time was a poor boy he had a dollar and a half and went into the mercantile business but he lost eighty-seven and a half cents of his first dollar and a half because he bought some needles and thread and buttons to sell which people didn't want are you poor it is because you are not wanted and are left on your own hands there was the great lesson apply it whichever way you will it comes to every single person's life young or old he did not know what people needed and consequently bought something they didn't want and had the goods left on his hands a dead loss a t stewart learned there the great lesson of his mercantile life and said i will never buy anything more until i first learn what the people want then i'll make the purchase he went around to the doors and asked them what they did want and when he found out what they wanted he invested his sixty-two and a half cents and began to supply a known demand i care not what your profession or occupation in life may be i care not whether you are a lawyer a doctor a housekeeper teacher or whatever else the principle is precisely the same we must know what the world needs first and then invest ourselves to supply that need and success is almost certain a t stewart went on until he was worth forty millions well you'll say a man can do that in new york but cannot do it here in philadelphia the statistics very carefully gathered in new york in eighteen eighty nine showed one hundred and seven millionaires in the city worth over ten millions apiece it was remarkable and people think they must go there to get rich out of that one hundred and seven millionaires only seven 
of them made their money in New York, and the others moved to New York after their fortunes were made, and sixty-seven out of the remaining hundred made their fortunes in towns of less than six thousand people. And the richest man in the country at that time lived in a town of thirty-five hundred inhabitants, and always lived there and never moved away. It is not so much where you are as what you are. But at the same time, if the largest of the city comes into the problem, then remember it is the smaller city that furnishes the great opportunity to make the millions of money. The best illustration that I can give is in reference to John Jacob Astor, who was a poor boy and who made all the money of the Astor family. He made more than his successors have ever earned, and yet he once held a mortgage on a millinery store in New York, and because the people could not make enough money to pay the interest and the rent, he foreclosed the mortgage and took possession of the store and went into partnership with the man who had failed. He kept the same stock, did not give them a dollar capital, and he left them alone, and went out and sat down upon a bench in the park. Out there on that bench in the park he had the most important, and to my mind, the pleasantest part of that partnership business. He was watching the ladies as they went by, and where is the man that wouldn't get rich at that business? But when John Jacob Astor saw a lady pass, with her shoulders back and her head up, as if she did not care if the whole world looked on her, he studied her bonnet. And before that bonnet was out of sight, he knew the shape of the frame and the color of the trimmings, the curl of the something on a bonnet. Sometimes I try to describe a woman's bonnet, but it is of little use, for it would be out of style tomorrow night. So. John Jacob Astor went to the store and said, Now, put in the show window just such a bonnet as I described to you, because, said he, I have just seen a lady who likes just such a bonnet. Do not make up any more till I come back. And he went out again and sat on that bench in the park, and another lady of a different form and complexion passed him with a bonnet of different shape and colour, of course. Now, said he, put such a bonnet as that in the show window. He didn't fill his show window with hats and bonnets which drive people away and then sit in the back of the store and bawl because the people go somewhere else to trade. He didn't put a hat or bonnet in that show window the like of which he had not seen before it was made up. In our city especially there are great opportunities for manufacturing and the time has come when the line is drawn very sharply between the stockholders of the factory and their employees now friends there has also come a discouraging gloom upon this country and the laboring men are beginning to feel that they are being held down by a crust over their heads through which they find it impossible to break and the aristocratic money owner himself is so far above that he will never descend to their assistance. That is the thought that is in the minds of our people. But, friends, never in the history of our country was there an opportunity so great for the poor man to get rich as there is now in the city of Philadelphia. The very fact that they get discouraged is what prevents them from getting rich. That is all there is to it. The road is open and let us keep it open between the poor and the rich. I know that the labor unions have two great problems to contend with, and there is only one way to solve them. The labor unions are doing as much to prevent its solving as are the capitalists today, and there are positively two sides to it. The labor union has two difficulties. The first one is that it began to make a labor scale for all classes on a par and they scale down a man that can earn five dollars a day to two and a half a day in order to level up to him an imbecile that cannot earn fifty cents a day that is one of the most dangerous and discouraging things for the working man he cannot get the results of his work if he do better work or higher work or work longer 
that is a dangerous thing and in order to get every laboring man free and every american equal to every other american let the laboring man ask what he is worth and get it not let any capitalist say to him you shall work for me for half of what you are worth nor let any labor organization say you shall work for the capitalist for half your worth be a man be independent and then shall the laboring man find the road ever open from poverty to wealth the other difficulty that the labor union has to consider and this problem they have to solve themselves is the kind of orators who come and talk to them about the oppressive rich I can, in my dreams, recite the oration I have heard again and again under such circumstances. My life has been with the laboring man. I am a laboring man myself. I have often, in their assemblies, heard the speech of the man who has been invited to address the labor union. The man gets up before the assembled company of honest laboring men, and he begins by saying, O oh, ye honest, industrious, laboring men, who have furnished all the capital of the world, who have built all the palaces, and constructed all the railroads, and covered the ocean with her steamships, O oh, you laboring men, you are nothing but slaves, you are ground down in the dust by the capitalist who is gloating over you, as he enjoys his beautiful estates, and as he has his bags filled with gold, and every dollar he owns is coined out of the heart's blood of the honest laboring man now that is a lie and you know it is a lie and yet that is the kind of speech that they are all the time hearing representing the capitalists as wicked and the laboring men so enslaved why how wrong it is let the man who loves his flag and believes in american principles endeavor with all his soul to bring the capitalist and the laboring man together until they stand side by side and arm in arm and work for the common good of humanity he is an enemy to his country who sets capital against labor or labor against capital Suppose I were to go down through this audience and ask you to introduce me to the great inventors who live here in Philadelphia. The inventors of Philadelphia, you would say? Why? Well, we don't have any in Philadelphia. It is too slow to invent anything. But you do have just as great inventors. And they are here in this audience as ever invented a machine. But the probability is that the greatest inventor to benefit the world with his discovery is some person, perhaps some lady, who thinks she could not invent anything. Did you ever study the history of invention and see how strange it was that the man who made the greatest discovery did it without any previous idea that he was an inventor? Who are the great inventors? They are persons with plain, straightforward common sense, who saw a need in the world and immediately applied themselves to supply that need. If you want to invent anything, don't try to find it in the wheels in your head, nor the wheels in your machine, but first find out what the people need, and then apply yourself to that need. And this leads to invention on the part of the people you would not dream of before the great inventors are simply great men the greater the man the more simple the man and the more simple a machine the more valuable it is did you ever know a really great man his ways are so simple so common so plain that you think anyone could do what he is doing so it is with the great men the world over if you know a really great man, a neighbor of yours, you can go right up to him and say, How are you, Jim? Good morning, Sam. Of course you can, for they are always so simple. When I wrote The Life of General Garfield, one of his neighbors took me to his back door and shouted, Jim, Jim, Jim! And very soon, Jim came to the door, and General Garfield let me in, one of the grandest men of our century the great men of the world are ever so 
I was down in Virginia, and went up to an educational institution, and was directed to a man who was setting out a tree. I approached him and said, Do you think it would be possible for me to see General Robert E. Lee, the President of the University? He said, Sir, I am General Lee. Of course, when you meet such a man, so noble a man as that, you will find him a simple, plain man. Greatness is always just so modest, and great inventions are simple. I asked a class in school once who were the great inventors, and a little girl popped up and said, Columbus. Well, now, she was not so far wrong. Columbus bought a farm, and he carried on that farm just as I carried on my father's farm. He took a hoe and went out and sat down on a rock. But Columbus, as he sat upon that shore and looked out upon the ocean, noticed that the ships, as they sailed away, sank deeper into the sea the farther they went. And since that time some other Spanish ships have sunk into the sea. But as Columbus noticed that the tops of the masts dropped down out of sight, he said, That is the way it is with this hoe handle. If you go around this hoe handle, the farther off you go, the farther down you go. I can sail around to the East Indies. How plain it all was! How simple the mind! Majestic like the simplicity of a mountain in its greatness! Who are the great inventors? They are ever the simple, plain, everyday people who see the need and set about to supply it. I was once lecturing in North Carolina, and the cashier of the bank sat directly behind a lady who wore a very large hat. I said to that audience, Your wealth is too near to you. You are looking right over it. He whispered to his friend, Well, then, my wealth is in that hat. A little later, as he wrote me, I said, Wherever there is a human need, there is a greater fortune than a mine can furnish. He caught my thought, and he drew up his plan for a better hat-pin than was in the hat before him. And the pin is now being manufactured. He was offered fifty-five thousand dollars for his patent. That man made his fortune before he got out of that hall. This is the whole question. Do you see a need? I remember well a man up in my native hills, a poor man, who for twenty years was helped by the town in his poverty, who owned a wide-spreading maple tree that covered the poor man's cottage like a benediction from on high. I remember that tree, for in the spring, there were some roguish boys around that neighborhood when I was young, in the spring of that year, the man would put a bucket there and the spout to catch the maple sap. And I remember where that bucket was, and when I was young the boys were oh, so mean that they went to that tree before that man had gotten out of bed in the morning, and after he had gone to bed at night, and drank up that sweet sap. I could swear they did it. He didn't make a great deal of maple sugar from that tree, but one day he made the sugar so white and crystalline that the visitor did not believe it was maple sugar, thought maple sugar must be red or black. He said to the old man, Why don't you make it that way and sell it for confectionery? The old man caught his thought and invented the rock maple crystal. And before that patent expired, he had ninety thousand dollars and had built a beautiful palace on the site of that tree. After forty years owning that tree, he awoke to find it had fortunes of money indeed in it and many of us are right by the tree that has a fortune for us and we own it possess it do what we will with it but we do not learn its value because we do not see the human need and in these discoveries and inventions this is one of the most romantic things of life i have received letters from all over the country and from england where i have lectured saying that they have discovered this and that and one man out in ohio took me through his great factories last spring and said that they cost him six hundred and eighty thousand dollars and said he i was not worth a cent in the world when i heard your lecture acres of diamonds but i made up my mind to stop right here and make my fortune here and here it is 
he showed me through his unmortgaged possessions and this is a continual experience now as i travel through the country after these many years i mention this incident not to boast but to show you that you can do the same if you will who are the great inventors i remember a good illustration in a man who used to live in east brookfield massachusetts he was a shoemaker and he was out of work and he sat around the house until his wife told him to go outdoors and he did what every husband is compelled to do he paid his wife and he went out and sat down on an ash barrel in his back yard think of it stranded on an ash barrel and the enemy in possession of the house as he sat on the ash barrel he looked down into that little brook which ran through that back yard into the meadows and he saw a little trout go flashing up the stream and hiding under the bank i do not suppose he thought of tennyson's beautiful poem chatter chatter as i flow to join the brimming river men may come and men may go but i go on forever but as this man looked into the brook he leaped off the ash barrel and managed to catch the trout with his fingers and sent it to worcester they wrote back that they would give him a five dollar bill for another such trout as that not that it was worth that much but they wished to help the poor man so this shoemaker and his wife now perfectly united that five dollar bill in prospect went out to get another trout they went up the stream to its source and down to the brimming river but not another trout could they find in the whole stream and so they came home disconsolate and went to the minister the minister didn't know how trout grew but he pointed the way said he get seth green's book and that will give you the information you want they did so and found all about the culture of trout they found that a trout lays thirty six hundred eggs every year and every trout gains a quarter of a pound every year so that in four years a little trout will furnish four tons per annum to sell in the market at fifty cents a pound when they found that they said they didn't believe any such story as that but if they could get five dollars apiece they could make something and right in that same backyard with the coal sifter upstream and window screen down the stream they began at the culture of trout they afterwards moved to the hudson and since then he has become the authority in the united states upon the raising of fish and he has been next to the highest on the united states fish commission in washington my lesson is that man's wealth was out there in his back yard for twenty years but he didn't see it until his wife drove him out with a mop stick i remember meeting personally a poor carpenter of hingham massachusetts who was out of work and in poverty his wife also drove him out of doors he sat down on the shore and whittled a soaked shingle into a wooden chain his children quarreled over it in the evening and while he was whittling a second one a neighbor came along and said why don't you whittle toys if you can carve like that he said i don't know what to make there is the whole thing his neighbor said to him why don't you ask your own children said he what is the use of doing that my children are different from other people's children i used to see people like that when i taught school the next morning when his boy came down the stairway he said sam what do you want for a toy i want a wheelbarrow when his little girl came down he asked her what she wanted and she said i want a little doll's washstand a little doll's carriage a little doll's umbrella and went on with a whole lot of things that would have taken his lifetime to supply he consulted his own children right there in his own house and began to whistle out toys to please them he began with his jackknife and made those unpainted hingham toys he is the richest man in the entire new england states if mr lawson is to be trusted in his statement concerning such things and yet that man's fortune was made by consulting his own children in his own house you don't need to go out of your own house to find out what to invent or what to make i always talk too long on this subject 
I would like to meet the great men who are here tonight. The great men. We don't have any great men in Philadelphia. Great men. You say that they all come from London, or San Francisco, or Rome, or Manor Young, or anywhere else but here, anywhere else but Philadelphia. And yet, in fact, there are just as great men in Philadelphia as in any city of its size. There are great men and women in this audience. Great men, I have said, are very simple men. Just as many great men here as are to be found anywhere. The greatest error in judging great men is that we think that they always hold an office. The world knows nothing of its greatest men. Who are the great men of the world? The young man and young woman may well ask the question. It is not necessary that they should hold an office, and yet that is the popular idea. That is the idea we teach now in our high schools and common schools, that the great men of the world are those who hold some high office. And unless we change that very soon and do away with that prejudice, we are going to change to an empire. There is no question about it. We must teach that men are great only on their intrinsic value and not on the position that they may incidentally happen to occupy. And yet, don't blame the young men saying that they are going to be great when they get into some official position. I ask this audience again, who of you are going to be great? Says a young man, I am going to be great. When are you going to be great? When I am elected to some political office. Won't you learn the lesson, young man, that it is prima facie evidence of littleness to hold public office under our form of government? Think of it. This is a government of the people and by the people and for the people and not for the office holder. And if the people in this country rule as they always should rule, an office holder is only the servant of the people. And the Bible says that the servant cannot be greater than his master. The Bible says that he that is sent cannot be greater than him who sent him. In this country, the people are the masters, and the office holders can never be greater than the people. They should be honest servants of the people, but they are not our greatest men. Young man, remember that you never heard of a great man holding any political office in this country unless he took that office at an expense to himself. It is a loss to every great man to take a public office in our country. Bear this in mind, young man, that you cannot be made great by a political election. Another young man says, I am going to be a great man in Philadelphia sometime. Is that so? When are you going to be great? When there comes another war, when we get into difficulty with Mexico or England or Russia or Japan or with Spain again over Cuba or with New Jersey, I will march up to the cannon's mouth and amid the glistening bayonets I will tear down their flag from its staff and I will come home with stars on my shoulders and hold every office in the gift of the government and I will be great. No, you won't. No, you won't. That is no evidence of true greatness, young man. But don't blame that young man for thinking that way. That is the way he is taught in the high school. That is the way history is taught in college. He is taught that the men who held the office did all the fighting. I remember we had a peace jubilee here in Philadelphia soon after the Spanish War. Perhaps some of these visitors think we should not have had it until now in Philadelphia. And as the great procession was going up Broad Street, I was told that the tally-ho coach stopped right in front of my house, and on the coach was Hobson. And all the people threw up their hats and swung their handkerchiefs and shouted, Hurrah for Hobson! I would have yelled too, because he deserves much more of his country than he has ever received. But suppose I go into the high school tomorrow and ask, Boys, who sunk the Merrimack? If they answer me, Hobson, they tell me seven-eighths of a lie. Seven-eighths of a lie because there were eight men who sunk the Merrimack. The other seven men, by virtue of their position, were continually exposed to the Spanish fire, while Hobson, as an officer, might reasonably be behind the smokestack. Why, my friends, in this intelligent audience gathered here tonight, I do not believe I could find a single person that can name the other seven men who were with Hobson. Why do we teach history in that way? 
we ought to teach that however humble the station a man may occupy if he does his full duty in his place he is just as much entitled to the american people's honor as is a king upon a throne we do teach it as a mother did her little boy in new york when he said mamma what great building is that that is general grant's tomb who was general grant he was the man who put down the rebellion is that the way to teach history do you think we would have gained a victory if it had depended on general grant alone oh no then why is there a tomb on the hudson at all why not simply because general grant was personally a great man himself but that tomb is there because he was a representative man and represented two hundred thousand men who went down to death for their nation and many of them as great as general grant that is why that beautiful tomb stands on the heights over the hudson i remember an incident that will illustrate this the only one that i can give tonight i am ashamed of it but i don't dare leave it out i close my eyes now i look back through the years to eighteen sixty three i can see my native town in the berkshire hills i can see that cattle show ground filled with people i can see the church there and the town hall crowded and hear bands playing and see flags flying and handkerchiefs streaming well do i recall at this moment that day the people had turned out to receive a company of soldiers and that company came marching up on the common they had served out one term in the civil war and had re-enlisted and they were being received by their native townsmen i was but a boy but i was captain of that company puffed out with pride on that day why a cambric needle would have burst me all to pieces as i marched on the common at the head of my company there was not a man more proud than i we marched into the town hall and then they seated my soldiers down in the centre of the house and i took my place down on the front seat and then the town officers filed through the great throng of people who stood close and packed in that little hall they came up on the platform formed a half circle around it and the mayor of the town the chairman of the select men in new england took his seat in the middle of that half circle he was an old man his hair was gray he never held an office before in his life he thought that an office was all he needed to be a truly great man and when he came up he adjusted his powerful spectacles and glanced calmly around the audience with amazing dignity suddenly his eyes fell upon me and then the good old man came right forward and invited me to come up on the stand with the town officers invited me up on the stand no town officer ever took notice of me before i went to war now i should not say that one town officer was there who advised the teacher to wail me but i meant no honourable mention so i was invited up on the stand with the town officers i took my seat and let my sword fall on the floor and folded my arms across my breast and waited to be received napoleon the fifth pride goeth before destruction and a fall when i had gotten my seat and all became silent through the hall the chairman of the select men arose and came forward with great dignity to the table and we all supposed he would introduce the congregational minister who was the only orator in the town and who would give the oration to the returning soldiers but friends you should have seen the surprise that ran over that audience when they discovered that this old farmer was going to deliver that oration himself he had never made a speech in his life before but he fell into the same error that others have fallen into he seemed to think that the office would make him an orator so he had written out a speech and walked up and down the pasture until he had learned it by heart and frightened the cattle and he brought that manuscript with him and taking it from his pocket he spread it carefully upon the table then he adjusted his spectacles to be sure that he might see it and walked far back on the platform and then stepped forward like this 
he must have studied the subject much for he assumed an elocutionary attitude he rested heavily upon his left heel slightly advanced the right foot threw back his shoulders opened the organs of speech and advanced his right hand at an angle of forty-five as he stood in that elocutionary attitude this is just the way that speech went this is it precisely some of my friends have asked me if i do not exaggerate it but i could not exaggerate it impossible this is the way it went although i am not here for the story but the lesson that is back of it fellow citizens as soon as he heard his voice his hand began to shake like that his knees began to tremble and then he shook all over he coughed and choked and finally came around to look at his manuscript then he began again fellow citizens we are we are we are we are we are very happy we are very happy we are very happy to welcome back to their native town these soldiers who have fought and bled and come back again to their native town we are especially we are especially we are especially we are especially pleased to see with us today this young hero that meant me this young hero who in imagination friends remember he said imagination for if he had not said that i would not be egotistical enough to refer to it this young hero who in imagination we have seen leading his troops leading we have seen leading we have seen leading his troops onto the deadly breach we have seen his shining his shining we have seen his shining we've seen his shining his shining sword flashing in the sunlight as he shouted to his troops come on oh dear 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 how little that good old man knew about war if he had known anything about war he ought to have known what any soldier in this audience knows is true that it is next to a crime for an officer of infantry ever in time of danger to go ahead of his men i with my shining sword flashing in the sunlight shouting to my troops come on i never did it do you suppose i would go ahead of my men to be shot in the front by the enemy and in the back by my own men that is no place for an officer the place for the officer is behind the private soldier in actual fighting how often as a staff officer i rode down the line when the rebel cry and yell was coming out of the woods sweeping along over the fields and shouted officers to the rear officers to the rear and then every officer goes behind the line of battle and the higher the officer's rank the farther behind he goes not because he is any the less brave but because the laws of war require that to be done if the general came up on the front line and was killed you would lose your battle anyhow because he has the plan of the battle in his brain and must be kept in comparative safety i with my shining sword flashing in the sunlight <laughs> there sat in the hall that day men who had given that boy their last hardtack who had carried him on their backs through deep rivers but some were not there they had gone down to death for their country the speaker mentioned them but they were but little noticed and yet they had gone down to death for their country gone down for a cause they believed was right and still believe was right though i grant to the other side the same that i ask for myself yet these men who had actually died for their country were little noticed and the hero of the hour was this boy why was he the hero simply because that man fell into that same foolishness this boy was an officer and those were only private soldiers I learned a lesson that I will never forget. Greatness consists not in holding some office. Greatness really consists in doing some great deed with little means in the accomplishment of vast purposes from the private ranks of life. That is true greatness. He who can give to this people better streets, better homes, better schools, better churches, more religion, more of happiness, more of God, he that can be a blessing to the community in which he lives tonight will be great anywhere. But he who cannot be a blessing where he now lives will never be great anywhere on the face of God's earth. 
We live in deeds, not years, in feeling, not in figures on a dial, in thoughts, not breaths. We should count time by heart throbs in the cause of right, Bailey says. He most lives who thinks most. If you forget everything I have said to you, do not forget this, because it contains more in two lines than all I have said. Bailey says, He most lives who thinks most, who feels the noblest, and who acts the best. End of section 48. Recorded by Paul Adams, www.yornguy.com. Section 49 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings from the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adams. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Asenwine. Section 49, Appendix D, Speeches for Study and Practice. Victor Hugo Honoré de Balzac, delivered at the funeral of Balzac, August 20, 1850. Gentlemen, the man who now goes down into this tomb is one of those to whom public grief pays homage. In one day all fictions have vanished. The eye is fixed not only on the heads that reign, but on heads that think and the whole country is moved when one of those heads disappears. Today we have a people in black because of the death of the man of talent, a nation in mourning for a man of genius. Gentlemen, the name of Balzac will be mingled in the luminous trace our epoch will leave across the future. Balzac was one of that powerful generation of writers of the 19th century who came after Napoleon, as the illustrious Pleiad of the 17th century came after Richelieu, as if in the development of civilization there were a law which gives conquerors by the intellect as successors to conquerors by the sword. Balzac was one of the first among the greatest, one of the highest among the best. This is not the place to tell all that constituted this splendid and sovereign intelligence. All his books form but one book, a book living, luminous, profound, where one sees coming and going and marching and moving, with I know not what of the formidable and terrible mixed with the real, all our contemporary civilization, a marvellous book which the poet entitled A Comedy and which he could have called history, which takes all forms and all style, which surpasses Tacitus and Suetonius, which traverses Beaumarchais and reaches Rabelais, a book which realizes observation and imagination, which lavishes the true, the esoteric, the commonplace, the trivial, the material, and which at times, through all realities, swiftly and grandly rent away, allows us all at once a glimpse of a most sombre and tragic ideal. Unknown to himself, whether he wished it or not, whether he consented or not, the author of this immense and strange work is one of the strong race of revolutionist writers. Balzac goes straight to the goal. Body to body, he seizes modern society. From all, he wrests something. From these an illusion, from those a hope, from one a catchword, from another a mask. He ransacked vice, he dissected passion. He searched out and sounded man, soul, heart, entrails, brain, the abyss that each one has within himself. And by grace of his free and vigorous nature, by a privilege of the intellect of our time which having seen revolutions face to face can see more clearly the destiny of humanity and comprehend providence better 
Balzac redeemed himself smiling and severe from those formidable studies which produced melancholy in Moliere and misanthropy in Rousseau. This is what he has accomplished among us. This is the work which he has left us, a work lofty and solid, a monument robustly piled in layers of granite from the height of which hereafter his renown shall shine in splendor great men make their own pedestal the future will be answerable for the statue his death stupefied paris only a few months ago he had come back to france feeling that he was dying he wished to see his country again as one who would embrace his mother on the eve of a distant voyage his life was short but full more filled with deeds than days alas this powerful worker never fatigued this philosopher this thinker this poet this genius has lived among us that life of storm of strife of quarrels and combats common in all times to all great men today he is at peace he escapes contention and hatred on the same day he enters into glory and the tomb thereafter beyond the clouds which are above our heads he will shine among the stars of his country all you who are here are you not tempted to envy him whatever may be our grief in presence of such a loss let us accept these catastrophes with resignation let us accept in it whatever is distressing and severe it is good perhaps it is necessary perhaps in an epoch like ours that from time to time the great dead shall communicate to spirits devoured with skepticism and doubt a religious fervor providence knows what it does when it puts people face to face with the supreme mystery and when it gives them death to reflect on death which is supreme equality as it is also supreme liberty providence knows what it does since it is the greatest of all instructors there can be but austere and serious thoughts in all hearts when a sublime spirit makes its majestic entrance into another life when one of those beings who have long soared above the crowd on the visible wings of genius spreading all at once other wings which we did not see plunges swiftly into the unknown no it is not the unknown no i have said it on another sad occasion and i shall repeat it today it is not night it is light it is not the end it is the beginning it is not extinction it is eternity is it not true my hearers such tombs as this demonstrate immortality in presence of the illustrious dead we feel more distinctly the divine destiny of that intelligence which traverses the earth to suffer and purify itself which we call man end of section forty nine recording by paul adams www dot com